I hope that um, you are uh, in good shape because we start a very interesting event today. In fact, uh, this is our first event um, scheduled to be uh, in another country. Uh, it's um, interesting because the majority of the people are in Sofia, but we call this uh, event uh, a Viennese one. Uh, this is the modern, uh, so to say, way to do events. Uh, the COVID pandemic, which was a big challenge for the humankind in the last 18 months, made it possible that we do events online, successful events online. And um, it is called uh, the Biotech Atelier uh, from Vienna because we got an invitation and a good support from the Vienna Business Agency to perform part uh, of our activities in Vienna and from Vienna. Um, it's a challenge also because the Biotech Atelier enters a very interesting, but uh, a bit new uh, topic for us, waters. Uh, we were inspired by our um, last atelier in September, where we had a short session on waters, and we have seen that waters are a big challenge, but also a big opportunity. And this is also one of the reasons why we decided to do this atelier partly from Vienna, because uh, Vienna is well known as a uh, the city where the water is a religion. So uh, I am very happy to have a lot of Viennese uh, lecturers on board, Austrian lecturers on board, but also uh, some international uh, contributors from the US, from India, and from other parts of the world. We are happy to have um, more than 100 uh, interested attendees who will join the event today. And we are also recording the event, so we will distribute it among uh, other interested parties after the event is finished. But let's leave the small talk beside. We have a distinguished group of um, friends of our endeavor who are here to open the Biotech Atelier. And I am really pleased to start with Mrs. Yurdanka uh, Fadekova. This is our mayor, the mayor of Sofia. I can say that Mrs. Van de Kuva is a good friend of the Biotech Atelier and also a big fan of modern biotechnologies, if I can say so. So, Mrs. Van de Kuva, the floor is yours to open this event. Thank you very much for joining us. Please. Аз ви благодаря, доктор Георгиев. Радвам се да ви видя. Госпожа Лили Павлова. И всички, които успявам да видя и всички, които не успявам да видя. Благодаря ви на вас, че се ангажирахте отново с организацията. Радвам се, че имам възможност да поздравя и да провеждаме за организационния форум. Because the subjects that you've uh, suggested, together with the colleagues from Vienna, are the subjects of the day. How Sofia has a traditional partnership with Vienna Municipality, and I would like to congratulate my colleagues from Vienna. This partnership is within the issues of environment, transportation, business. And I'm very pleased that together again with you, we're here today. The biotechnological sector and the field of life sciences are one of the most developing in the last few years 
on the global scale. This, of course, is applicable for Bulgaria and for Sofia as well. Sofia, as a capital, is called upon to lead Bulgaria on the path to the new industries and new technologies. In Sofia, you can see starting companies in the field of medicine, uh, of biotechnology. The last few years, we've opened a lot of R&D centers. The very highly educated young people are the ones that are tracked. ID, IT and R&D industries in the field of biotechnology. For us, for Sophie municipality, for me personally, the development of industries is important, and especially to industries that are related to technologies in the field of um, healthcare, lifestyles, and solutions for energy and water efficiency. I'm very pleased that last year, Sofia signed a cooperation agreement with the cluster, the biotechnological healthcare cluster of Bulgaria in Sofia Tech Park. The goal of which is to create and develop the first of its kind in Sofia biotechnological center. And the idea is to create this center was actually born in Vienna, where we had the opportunity to visit the center and to see ourselves, the benefits for the city and for the people that work there. Our idea is this center to be a field where scientists, the students, local and sm uh, small enterprises, can find appropriate intellectual and expert environment to support them, not only in their starting, but also in the development of their business. And for us, for the development of the city, it's important for us that the center can position Sofia in the map of uh, the natural, of the global map of life scientists and biotechnology. Right now, with uh, Dr. Georgiev and with the team of the cluster, we work uh, on starting of this mapping, creating of the database that allows us to describe all of the resources. And this is a task that I would like to open the gate to Sofia, to partnership with the, the businesses, with the international businesses, with the scientific field, and to market Sofia as a place for investment, science, technology development, and healthcare. And thanks to this mapping, to have specific uh, calculation of the right functioning of this biotechnology center. I'm very pleased to see that here, um, to, see, to see here Mrs. Pavlova that are, as a representative of the investment bank, she could assist us in the development of this center because I believe that it truly could give opportunity to the businesses and to the people of science and education. Our sustainable development is to um, encourage uh, innovation. And this is why the last few years we've created a special, uh, special portfolio for digital development and support of businesses that's being run by a very promising young man. Uh, his name is Gentry Kerezu who has the task to implement the strategy for digital transformation of Sofia, as well as the action plan that we've um, 
accepted in the municipal council a few years back. I would just uh, mention uh, two pilot projects on the uh, municipal program for innovative solutions. One is related to creating prototypes for sensors that uh, will follow and monitor the air quality for Sophie. This is uh, one of, continues to be uh, the quality of air, it continues to be a leading priority. And the second pilot project is to better the energy efficiency in buildings. We plan in a to, to, to start um, in the second half of this year on two other projects, optimizing the consumption of uh, communal services, long-term projects for communication program to gather and collect data uh, for the uh, real life uh, consumption of cons uh, communal services. And also, we are partners in creation of co competence center through the uh, European Fund for uh, Regional Development. We have as our partner the Sofia, the University of Sofia. And the implementation of this pro project will lead to creation of a center of innovation activity in priority field, including uh, purification and use of clean water. We we are happy people because our country, our city, uh, is very rich in water. And at the same time, we're facing the challenges to decrease the, the loss of water. This is the task of the concessioner that's, uh, that's running the water sector in Sofia, because we follow up closely the prognosis and we know that in the long term, water will become the, the, the huge resource, a very big richness for the people. Uh, in this very complicated situation that we're living in, I'm convinced with the energy, with more institutions and teams and partnerships with international partners, we will find leading solutions and useful ideas. I believe that the presented forum is such an opportunity where we could, the, the young entrepreneurs can find their way for development. Again, I'm thankful for this invitation to be opening this forum and I wish you all great success. Mrs. Van de Kuwa, thank you very much once again for the nice words. Uh, I can confirm that everything what you said is true because I am part of the recent developments in the Sofia biotech ecosystem. And I can only say that cross my fingers that we are able to succeed uh, in all our plans. Soon or late, we will have a good biocenter in Sofia. And this biocenter will be a excellent competition to the Viennese one. Thank you very much once again. Uh, ladies first, as usually, now it's my pleasure to give the floor to Mrs. Liliana Pavlova. Mrs. Liliana Pavlova is a vice president of the European Investment Bank and apparently she is interested in water and biotechnology. Mrs. Pavlova, you have the word. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Georgiev. Uh, good morning from Luxembourg. It, as you said, it's a great opportunity that based on technologies we can meet and share and discuss and exchange in this in these uh, interesting times that we are living. Уважаема госпожо Фандъкова, изключително се радвам, че сме заедно отново на това важно събитие и тази тема. 
the Mayor Fandukova, the Mr. King, uh, the organizers of the event, um, ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen, colleagues and friends. It is indeed pleasure for me to be with you today, unfortunately only virtually, but I hope we will have uh, soon uh, new opportunities to meet and to exchange in person. Uh, it is it is a very interesting event and an, an important topic for for all of us, I believe. Uh, in these exceptional times, uh, the gravity of COVID-19 crisis is still unfolding. Uh, we are required to take all necessary steps uh, to cushion the health and economic fallout. But while this is already a daunting challenge per se, we have to think and to plan the recovery uh, for. For the, for the future. We have to be decisive about the, the principle, principles that guide us. The pandemic has led us to rethink many aspects of our lives and uh, we must turn it into a defining moment in our fight against climate change and environmental degradation. Uh, the starting point is quite challenging. Uh, the virus is uh, taking uh, an immense toll of human lives, but unfortunately people also die today as a consequence of climate change. Uh, they die of floods, of droughts, of uh, vast and unstoppable forest fires. Our available water resources are threatened by climate change. Water covers 70% of Earth's uh, surface, but less than 3% in fresh water, and of that, three-thirds is not accept uh, accessible, it, as it is in uh, glaciers uh, and ice caps. By 2025, the stress of diminishing available water resources will be felt by two thirds of the world population. Climate change is further deteriorating the situation. In the mountains, glaciers are residing quickly, affecting the availability of water of, uh, for millions of, of people around the world. By 2050, the number of people who lack sufficient water at least one month per year, uh, will we'll soar to more than 5 million people from 3.6 million people today, causing indeed an unprecedented competition for water. Uh, there are the World Resources Institute estimates by that by 2030, 15 million people and 177 billions of dollars in urban property will be impacted annually by coastal flooding, while 132 million people and $535 billion in urban property will be impacted annually uh, due to the ravine flooding. The economic wall, uh, role of, of water cannot be overestimated with some 78% of all jobs worldwide dependent on water. So while the coronavirus has shaken our societies, we should also not forget about the existential threat that climate change presents to, to our world. Even if we manage to keep global temperature rises to 1.5 uh, degrees Celsius, specific measures will be needed to deal with the climate change and to avoid agriculture's um, encroachment in, uh, on our uh, natural resources. We, the European Investment Bank, as EU Climate Bank, we have an imp important role to, to play. And uh, as part of, uh, of the overall European Union uh, green agenda and green recovery and accelerating measures and efforts to combat climate change, we, the EU Climate Bank, we have uh, an important role to play also in this important endeavor. Last year, uh, we adopted uh, our Climate Bank Roadmap for the period 2021-25, which uh, sets out uh, in detail how we will achieve the goals we set ourselves to support the European Green Deal. First one, and uh, one of the main priorities to phase out support to projects reliant to unabated fossil fuels. Second, and to align all uh, our financing activities with the, with the principles of the Paris Agreement. 
third is to dedicate 50% of our financing to climate action and environmental sustainability by 2025. And we have already dedicated our uh, annually 40% of our annual lending, which is at the approximate amount of 70, 70, 70 billion euro per year. And last but not least, we have a long term ambitious goal by the uh, in, in the decade and from today until 2030 to support and to mobilize 1 trillion euro of investment in climate action and investments in environmental sustainability. Our climate bank roadmap being a five year plan for for the EAB and our subsidiary European investment fund is to is prepared in order to make sure that we support the green recovery from COVID-19 crisis and the pandemic. Uh, and of course, that we fully back the European Green Deal, including its just transition. We are now implementing already the, our climate roadmap, uh, and we look uh, forward indeed to work together with, with all public and private sector partners on the key elements. Uh, notably on, the, on, on a common approach on green finance and investments that uh, could form the basis for further developing uh, targets in support of the respective EU environmental policies and strategies. That's why the, the, this biocenter, which, for example, which is envisaged in Sofia, it uh, could be an excellent flagship project that we can further discuss on how it could be supported. Increased investments uh, in flood protection, water security, uh, or water reuse and innovation uh, will be uh, necessary if we want to adapt to and to mitigate the effects of the climate change. I will say now a few words what, uh, what we are financing in the water sector. European Investment Bank is one of the largest multilateral lenders to global water sector today with close to 79 billion already invested in over uh, 1,600 projects, uh, we are making water security and climate action as, as, a, as a very, very important uh, priority. During the last programming period of the European Union funding 2040-2020, uh, EIB lent 21 uh, billion euro to water projects worldwide with uh, 23% supporting projects also outside of EU and also in the United Kingdom, which is approximately 5 billion euro out of those 29. Last year, we invested 4 billion euro in, uh, in, in the water sector, resulting in improved sanitation for more than 15 million people, reduced the uh, risk of flooding of more than 1.8 million people, safer drinking water for, for 30 million people and reduced exposure to drought risk to, to almost 9 million people around the globe. Water investments are fully in, in line with our bank's increased ambition to support climate actions and uh, sustainable financing. The sector largely contributes to both climate mitigation and climate adaptation. In the last three years, climate action accounted for about 50% of our bank's water sector project. We support investment that uh, increase secure access to water resources, protect uh, uh, projects that protect uh, against, against floods and other destructive water related events, uh, and ensures reliable provision of sustainable and affordable water and wastewater services uh, promoting resource efficiency, energy efficiency, and, uh, and also in, uh, in, for chemicals and, and water itself. We help our, our clients uh, to maximize their resources. In the water sector, uh, in the wastewater sector, we finance facilities with, uh, with a focus on energy and materials recovery. For instance, biogas that turns recycled bio waste into renewable energy. Such integrated approaches, for example, by using uh, treated wastewater for ir irrigation, show that we can sustainably manage limited global resources. 
Our support comes uh, not only through our financial instruments, but also uh, via offering a wide range of uh, technical assistance and technical advisory tools. Uh, our bank's advisory services are providing support, including under so-called FI, uh, FIA Compass uh, platform to national authorities willing to use financial instruments with, with aim to promote access to finance and investments. The European Investment Bank and together with the European Commission, we have worked together to launch a number of uh, advisory mandates and specific, specially dedicated programs to address specific needs of cohesion countries. Instruments well known like JASPERS, like a project advisory support uh, program, and also uh, the European Investment Advisory Hub. As an example, I could mention one of our uh, JASPER assignments completed last year in Bulgaria in support of uh, investments in the water sector. And this was namely the, the waste, uh, uh, sorry, the, in, the integrated water project in, uh, in Sofia, stage one, with a total cost of 74 uh, million euro of which uh, more than uh, 43 million are European Union grant funding. The project aims at reaching compliance with uh, national and EU legislation in the field of uh, wastewater collect collection, treatment and disposal, as well as improving the operation of, wa of the wastewater treatment plant. Our JASPER team supported the preparation of the project with the selection process of for the project area, feasibility study and technical documentation for the for the, uh, for the application form for, for grant funding. Our lending, as well as our advisory services, uh, have strengthened uh, thanks to a variety of tailor-made products, which were put in place, put in place uh, specifically to address sector's needs, depending on the specificities of each sector, each country, and the, the authorities with whom we are partnering. In addition, of course, we are providing support to research and innovation in the water sector. The changing uh, environmental uh, regulatory uh, framework, uh, the climate change impact, and the rising use of chemicals and pollutants results in an increased scope for innovation uh, in the EU water sector. Most promising uh, innovative water technologies are developed in three areas energy and nutrient recovery in uh, wastewater treatment plants, digital water via sensoring and uh, monitoring, and water and wastewater treatment technologies. Uh, we, uh, our team in the bank, uh, has commissioned a study looking into innovation into, in, in the water sector in the context of the European Innovation Partnership for Water. Regulatory risk and low financial margins were primary causes for municipal and also agricultural sectors to be hesitant in the adoption of uh, innovative solutions and technologies, and consequently uh, for, for really to, to face the lack of investors. While this note uh, not being able to provide grants, we, the, the European Investment Bank, uh, we do, however, uh, have many financial instruments at the disposal of uh, municipal and other authorities also in, for the, for the, not only for the public sector, but also for the private sector that allow, uh, that allow us to support innovation and scaling up rollout. This applies uh, uh, not only for loans for utilities, uh, or, I mean, for utilities uh, on R&D, but also loans specifically uh, targeted for R&D by uh, equipment producers, such as uh, Grundfos, a leading producer of water pumping equipment, or equity uh, for funds such as PERL, an infrastructure fund investing in environmental uh, facilities in partnership with uh, municipalities and uh, with large industrial companies all around Europe. Uh, also, we are supporting research and innovation in uh, bioeconomy to fight climate change and to promote sustainable bioeconomy, financing research and development and innovation projects, including, uh, including ramp up to fill commer commercialization is key. 
uh, innovative businesses often do not have access uh, to finance because their projects deal with complex products and technologies, unproven markets, or intangible assets. The, th the, the fact that uh, bio-based industries uh, and their projects are, uh, are likely to face constraints when accessing private capital uh, is confirmed by, uh, by our bank's study on access to finance conditions. The main funding gaps exist in scaling up from, uh, from pilot to demonstration project. Uh, we in the bank, we have uh, first-hand experience in developing instruments that overcome barriers to the implementation of investment projects uh, across the bioeconomy sector, such as INUFI, a joint program between EAB and the, the European Commission supporting and providing financing and also advisory support for the innovative solutions to be developed and deployed. Uh, DAB also, uh, as I mentioned before, includes and has a, has a subsidiary, our European Investment Fund. So while the bank itself provides financing and advisory support and expertise in investment projects, our lending arm, uh, our subsidiary European Investment Fund, is a specialist provider in risk finance for innovative SMEs. The, our fund designs and develops equity, guarantee, and microfinance instruments that specifically target this market segment. Uh, in its role, it pursues uh, your objectives in support of innovation, research and development, and entrepreneurship, supporting growth and employment. So this brings me to the end of my intervention. Water is the source of life, but also the resource most affected by the climate change. An increased frequency of extreme weather severely impacts the availability and quality of fresh water resources, causing water-related natural disasters such as drought and flood. It is imperative that COVID-19 does not dilute our commitment towards climate and sustainable growth agenda. A stronger and faster action and more ambitious plan for the path towards meeting sustainable development goals needs to be built. To maximize our global impact, we at the EAB, at the group of, of the bank and the fund, we are ready to partner with all institutions, not just as an not not just as an incubator for finance, but also as an incubator for knowledge and ideas that drive the transition to a low carbon and sustainable environment. Of course, along with all our common efforts to support sustainable and smooth economic recovery from COVID-19 pandemic, we need, of course, to focus on green and digital recovery. I'll stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. And I hope you will really enjoy the rest of the presentations and discussing, discussions which will follow. Thank you very much once again. Mrs. Pavlova, thank you very much indeed. Um, the commitment of the European Investment Bank, which you show, uh, shared right now, made my day actually, and my week, and my month, because now I know very well that the direction we go, more uh, interaction between biotechnology and water is an actual one, and we will have a good future if we invest our knowledge and enthusiasm and meet your uh, supporting function in order to develop a better world for us and also for our children. Uh, now, it's my pleasure to give the floor to Mr. Walter Klink. Mr. Walter Klink is uh, holding executive positions in two very interesting um, endeavors. The one is Vienna Vasa. I'm living in Vienna partially in the last 15 years, and I know that the water, as I said in the beginning, is a religion in Vienna. But you are also taking part in the uh, in one of our institutional partners of this uh, event, the International Association of uh, Water Suppliers and the Danube region, where the water is not that a religion like in Vienna in some of the countries. So, Mr. Kling, the floor is yours. Uh, Dimitar, may, may I just quickly ask how much time I have? I missed this information on 
how, how, how much I'm loud. Mr. Klink, you have 15 minutes. Okay. Uh, but uh, if you need more, you are welcome because you are one of our important guests. So we can have also an academic delay. But the floor is yours. Don't pay uh, too much attention on the time. Okay. Uh, many thanks for being being invited here. Uh, also, many thanks to Rado making this uh, this possible. And uh, uh, with the beginning, I would uh, would start not just uh, telling you the story of uh, of um, how we uh, created IWD uh, as a network and an association in uh, in the Danube region. But um, basically, how we how we found this uh, interaction uh, uh, important, and this is not uh, only related through uh, the network which we have in IWD. This is a variety of activities, uh, definitely including also other institution, finance institution, but uh, in particular uh, our. our our involvement into uh, activities of the European Union uh, since the start in, in 1995 when we when we joined uh, the, uh, the the European Union. Um, just to uh, to give you an idea about uh, and our our network our our work in the in international association of waterworks in the Danube catchment area is mainly uh, and uh, absolutely focused on the cooperation of the water utilities. It started in 93 and it was based on the contacts we already had. The political change in uh, the east of Europe uh, made it uh, possible and it was a request also from various countries um, to, uh, to create a new, uh, new uh, way of uh, cooperation. The idea was established, as I said, in 1993. Uh, we joined the European Union in 95. So just uh, as a clear picture, some decades back in the 90s, uh, we were also young and uh, in, in the European Union, we had to change late, uh, legislation. We had to adopt uh, the framework directives of uh, of um, uh, the European Union. We had uh, to adopt uh, our laws, but as well, we were invited to create uh, to also take part in the development of those. This easily brought us uh, as a as a network and association in the role of helping and assisting others with our experience in um, um, in the work and cooperation of the European Union. And I could tell the stories more than fifty minutes or uh, uh, hours of what the experience was out of that. But what was the aim? The aim was uh, to um, to create this network idea, which we participate now in your event as well, as an information broker, as uh, an association who bring interesting content like your event here uh, to a broader audience, audience, which might not probably particular pick Pick up uh, such an event uh, as a need for their for their work, but uh, with uh, with the support of of a network and and our community, uh, we we act as a door opener. Uh, one of these very useful and uh, very often used examples. Uh, is our cooperation with the International Water Association, uh, which is also um, uh, has a, a rich diversity of uh, special fields, special uh, interests um, in, in the technology and research. And uh, from the practical points of water loss uh, to um, sludge management in, in uh, wastewater utilities, the whole variety of, uh, of, of important um, uh, activities can be covered. Um, as an outcome of that, 
uh, we uh, we act as a uh, cooperation partner also for organizing events. So we did a variety of groundwater conferences in Belgrade, water loss conferences in Bucharest, uh, U, uh, UPN utility conferences in Vienna. But the main the main uh, event uh, still in our memory was in the year 2008, uh, the World Conference, which was um, um, organized in Vienna. And I had the honor to act as a, co a Congress president to bring this event uh, to the Danube region. And I always want to state this uh, clearly uh, to showcase how important our role as a, as a representative of the region is. Uh, we were not uh, we were not nominated to run the world conference on behalf of Austria, but on behalf of the Danube region. IWD was accepted as a regional partner, and I think this was really uh, a boost uh, for the water sector in our region uh, to be internationally recognized. And if you compare this now to the ongoing activities which we have in the 2020s. Uh, uh, we are we are constantly raising our level, and your your event is is a good example of showcasing how this race uh, of uh, of impact and uh, the race of knowledge which is shared is 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 a growing issue, and we are welcoming uh, each of this initiative because it it supports the sector, it uh, supports uh, uh, the opportunity of this sector and. And those who participate uh, to to grow their knowledge and their involvement, and uh, like presentations we heard before, which made us very optimistic, uh, and uh, and uh, is is something which need to be sent out to to the water community in the region, and this is where we see our role. So we are not the leading scientists, we are not the best of the best. Uh, but we are the ones who really want to help our colleagues in the region uh, to learn from each other, to exchange ideas. And sometimes uh, the utilities recognize that in my neighboring country, there are two utilities who are suffering with the same problem. And we, we get connected and we solve problems on a, on a very direct way. And this is the strength of our association. Coming back for a few minutes on uh, Vienna Water and uh, Dimita, you, you were saying, well, you you like the Vienna Water. Uh, uh, thanks for thanks for that compliment, and you uh, you join a big group of our citizens who are also uh, quite happy with the conditions uh, we have in Vienna. We are very carefully managing this treasure. We, we know that out of our history that we have uh, supply Vienna with spring water is not something which we invited uh, in the last cent uh, in, in the last decade. It's a 140 year story. And nowadays it turns into a treasure. When it was uh, created 1873, uh, there was only um, a discussion on the costs and whether this is uh, efficient or not. And uh, the alternative would have been to use water from the Danube. Uh, the, the Danube goes directly to Vienna. So the question was, why do, don't you use this water? You can filter it, uh, but you, you provide the spring water. Nowadays, with climate change, with water scarcity, with uh, quality issues on on, on treatment on, uh, for for drinking water, we are in a different world compared to the 140 years ago when this decision was made. So our task here in the management of the inner water is to keep this very high level, to keep the expectation of the citizens for this good quality. So everybody is just saying, whatever you do, just keep this condition. And this, this is something uh, which is also tricky. It's manageable. We keep the system up to date uh, in, in a digital world, but it still works like a Roman uh, uh, aqueduct. Yeah? The water flows by the power of creativity uh, to Vienna and we supply with the power of creativity. It's even a good example uh, of um, uh, 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 
energy saving and uh, efficient use of energy. But as I said, it's nothing we invited. It's something which we keep because it was invited 140 years ago. So sometimes good ideas pay back. Uh, and uh, I, I need to pay my gratitude to uh, our, our forefathers in, in developing and deciding, making the decision of that. Probably also a good example of what sustainable uh, uh, management of a utility really means. It's keep the condition as it is, if it's good, and keep the conditions in the best way. We were several times asked whether the city of Vienna is prepared to uh, sell the water utility uh, to investors. There is politically a very clear will from the city of Vienna to say this is never going to take the place. And even in the, uh, the, uh, the water supply is protected by the city constitution. So there's no way to, uh, for any government of the city to, uh, to make decisions, um, to, to make um, uh, a quick profit out of this uh, treasure, as uh, Dimitar was saying. So we will keep it. We will keep this pressure, in, uh, this, uh, um, uh, this, this good water in Vienna and keep, uh, keep the conditions. Uh, and we are, we are one of the ambassadors together with, under, uh, with others of the water utility sector in the Danube region and IWD with capacity development. And this is my last point. It's not only um, exchanging this on events, but if you um, go to our uh, communication webpage, Voice of the Danube, you might see uh, uh, this very, uh, very big range of activities which we have available uh, to support, whether it's uh, capacity building, it's uh, benchmarking, uh, whether it's uh, events which we create, the Danube Water Conference. Whether it's the virtual events which we had to create now in the year um, uh, 2020, and we quickly adopted those conditions in a way that we are also possible now uh, to to do this virtually. Uh, with that, I, I hope I gave a, a quick summary of uh, what IWD is about with the background of Vienna Water. I hope you will have a very good uh, event today. And to everyone, I have two wishes. One is keep safe and uh, in, in good health conditions. And the second one is, I hope this whole thing is soon over and we will have real events yeah, with some good evenings and some uh, time for exchange uh, over a good dinner and uh, probably a couple of good drinks uh, to grow this water sector. Because what we do virtually at the moment, we maintain the sector, but if we want to grow it, we need to meet again. We need to talk to each other, not only for 15 minutes, but probably over a good beer in the afternoon or evening as well. Uh, with that, I send my regards from Vienna on behalf of IWD. I hope you will visit our webpage, Voice of the Danube, and uh, I hope you will have a good event. Give me that. Back to you. Uh, Mr. Klink, thank you very much. This was a real, a really inspirating talk. And I take the liberty to invite you on our next physical event in Sofia, and we will be with pleasure your host. Uh, just to tell you that uh, the Viennese beer is famous, uh, and also the Austrian wine, but we uh, can compete in terms of wine and probably also in terms of beer. So you are mostly welcome. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I have to thank also to our uh, two other guests, Mrs. Van Dukova and Mrs. Pavlova. It was really an inspiring start of our meeting. And now it's my pleasure to give further the floor to Mr. Radoslav Rusev, who is actually the person who inspired us to go into the water to make this uh, event and who was uh, strongly supporting our steps uh, on a daily basis. Thank you, everybody, and have a nice meeting. See you later. Bye from me. And uh, also a word of thanks from my side to uh, Mrs. Pandukova, Mrs. Pavlova, and uh, Walter Kling for the quite operational introduction to the topic. I mean, we are often used to having a uh, very general welcoming words, but now the three 
special guests made quite a, a deep, practical and operational entry into the topic. So that uh, helped us. Uh, over the next couple of hours, we will try to introduce lots of other speakers into the topic. I have the pleasure of moderating some of the panels and uh, we'll try to make some hopefully logical connections between uh, between the panels, between the introductory words and between everything that we have created as uh, expectations. Basically, the big purpose of the event, as uh, Dr. Georgiev said in the beginning, but I will repeat that uh, probably in different words, is that uh, we really want to make uh, to make sense of the overlapping areas and overlapping topics between biotechnologies and water. Many of our speakers today sit on the side of water, like myself. Others are more on the side of biotechnologies, medicine, academic research, etc. Uh, and we have quite a few which are uh, very much in between, uh, and that's particularly valuable. Without wasting too much time, I would like to move into the first of our three specific thematic panels, which is portable water and biotechnologies. Basically, as uh, most of you know, uh, water typically, the water business is typically split into water supply and sanitation. That's uh, quite conventional uh, all around the world. And when we say sanitation, we include both sewerage and wastewater treatment. And in an attempt to follow that logic, we have uh, decided to split our event into a panel decided to portable water and biotechnologies, another one on wastewater and biotechnologies, and we have a very special last panel uh, related to how we match the needs of uh, more about business topics, how we match the needs of uh, water and with uh, business and uh, commercial initiatives. With this, I would like to move into, into the first one, in which uh, I will myself deliver an introductory presentation, and then I will pass the, to the floor to Mrs. Sabine Langer and uh, Professor Atanasov from Bulgaria. Now, let me share my screen with uh, a couple of hopefully provocative slides. Give me a second. Just a second. Can you see my slides? Hope you can yes, it's possible for someone to confirm to me. Yes. Ah, thank you. Thanks, 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 thanks. Okay. Uh, a very big area of overlap between biotechnologies and water is uh, water quality, water testing, water analysis, water treatment, probably most of everything else. And because in Eastern Europe, uh, the region where I have worked most of my life, we have been extremely focused on water quantities, water flow, non-revenue water, water losses, and everything in this domain. Uh, and probably rightly so, because we have water losses and we are beginning to have certain regions where water scarcity is becoming a problem. Uh, and because many of our panelists today come from our region, I would still like to raise the question of whether quantity is really a bigger issue compared to water quality, because there are opinions in both, both directions. I would like to start with a figure, uh, although there are certain speculations about this figure. Uh, it was about 10 years ago, probably slightly more, when in a special report on water topics in the economist the introductory words started with 
a finger of 4,000 cubic kilometers, the, which is the annual uh, amount of water that is being consumed, abstracted for drinking water, commercial, industrial, and irrigation purposes. And that's a massive figure. I mean, it took me like 10, 20 seconds to make sense of that figure because to imagine what a cubic kilometer is, is uh, difficult, <laughs> at least. Uh, since that, I've been from time to time trying to make sense of that figure. Uh, how much is that for cubic, 4,000 cubic kilometers? which uh, is 4 trillion <laughs> cubic meters. And in order to make sense of that figure, uh, as there are quite a few people from Bulgaria today, you can imagine that the Lake Iskar, which is the source of water for uh, the city of Sofia, and that has at the moment enough water for more than two years of the total consumption of our capital city, 1.5 million people live in Sofia. Uh, the total capacity of this big reservoir is half a cubic kilometer. And uh, globally, we use more than 4,000 of these per year. That helped me put the things in perspective for myself, at least. Uh, and I'm sure that many of you, particularly those of you who come from water utilities, have been very much focused on water volume, water volumes uh, throughout your, your, your careers. Now, in the water world, particularly in water supply and sanitation, I believe that by far the biggest topic in the last 10, 15 years, probably more, through organizations like IWD, one of our partners today, like World Bank, like UN, uh, like the Global Water Association, the International Water Association, etc. One of the biggest narratives in the water sector has been water scarcity, insufficient water volumes, uh, tightly interlinked topic with the climate change, a very trendy term in our sector being non-revenue water, this abbreviation NRW, probably the colleagues in the biotechnology sector are not that used to seeing, but in the water supply and sanitation in the world of water utilities, this topic is in all our documents. And I'm sure that many of you have heard stories about day zero in which uh, many cities or many regions and agglomerations are expected to be left without water. Probably one of the most famous being uh, Cape Town in South Africa, which one way or another didn't quite get to day zero, but the situation was pretty scared. So, objectively, water scarcity is an issue, but I want to provoke you, hopefully, to reflect on whether this is the biggest issue in our sector. Uh, one analogy which I've been thinking about in recent weeks and months, uh, since I got introduced to this topic accidentally, is with the hunger and how we feed the world. I mean, obviously some 56 years ago, somewhere in the 50s, 60s, of the uh, last uh, century, there was a big green revolution, uh, which was primarily centered on agricultural sector, new varieties of the major uh, crops were introduced, uh, new uh, methods of uh, uh, new fertilizers, there's new uh, plant protection, uh, technologies, etc. And at the moment, although there are still a ridiculous amount of people who are hungry, what the scientists say is that a much bigger number of people are actually suffering from what they call the hidden hunger. 
they have enough calories, their calorie intake is sufficient, but they don't take the right nutrients. And that's easy to explain. And probably in solving the problem with undernourishment, we may have created uh, at least partially the other problem. I want to divert this analogy to water. I mean, personally, I believe that with technologies like desalination, with water reuse, to which uh, there will be speakers talking later today, we will sooner or later fully or partially sustainably or unsustainably uh, will achieve success in the area of uh, uh, addressing water scarcity but uh, there is a growing evidence that water quality related issues are of equal or at least similar concern i would like to conclude by giving three small examples that are very close to me personally from my experience and uh, uh, knowledge in the Bulgarian uh, context. I wanted this to be very, very specific. Three uh, water utilities, one of them, Sofia Water, Sofia City, uh, three cities, let me not refer specifically to, to the water utilities, but three cities. Sofia City, that's my professional home, I, I can say. I mean, personally, I spent 10 years there, although quite a bit ago. Uh, one of the best managed water utilities in Eastern Europe, I would say. Uh, and together with uh, Wien Wasser, uh, I believe some of the good water utilities in the region. That's a company which, although it loses quite a lot of its water as of today, it managed to reduce non-revenue water substantially. But uh, as many of you can expect, when we have reduced water consumption and substantial success in reducing non-revenue water, one of the challenges that we faced some 10, 15 years ago, which I remember from practice, was that the lower velocities significantly increase the time that it takes water to flow from treatment, storage, additional fluorination down to its end use by, by the end customer, I mean. And that's a perfectly solvable problem, uh, and it has been successfully solved by additional fluorination, by flush outs, etc. I'm just mentioning this that uh, there was this aspect in the work of this water utility. I will now fo focus on two other examples where the problem with water quality is much more difficult to resolve. Dobridge is a water company which is notorious for its uh, state uh, in my country, in Bulgaria. Uh, somehow I managed to, I happened to manage that company for a short period of time, uh, nine years ago. Uh, I didn't achieve that much, to be honest. But uh, the focus which I want to, to, to place here is that this is a water utility that has historically focused on ridiculously high amount of water losses. Unfortunately, in combination with very expensive water because it is pumped, it is underground water. But because this is a very agricultural area, the uncontrolled use of pesticides historically, and I would say even more so in recent years, have created an issue of contamination. The, the screenshot here in the second column actually is about uh, an article in one Bulgarian newspaper related to people being uh, poisoned with contaminated water because of pesticides. And last but not least, uh, Bulgaria last year made its place in the in the news emissions with a water topic which is ridiculous for a European country uh, today. Uh, one of our regional centers, a city close to Sofia with probably around 80, 90,000 90, people population was left without water. Uh, and although everyone was concerned about the water regime, I'm sure that many of you would believe that water quality now after this ridiculous water regime would be a much longer term and much more difficult to resolve problems 
I would like to stop here and uh, in, in introducing this uh, discussion, I just wanted to, 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 to put together these slides and to address all of you as an audience from the perspective of water supply and sanitation utilities. I mean, in today's event, I'm much more on the side of uh, water utilities. Uh, by asking you, by provoking you, hopefully, to reflect on whether topics related to the quality of water and everything that this brings about further down in the value chain, like uh, treatment technologies, like testing uh, requirements, like uh, online monitoring, like deeper analytical services and analysis, etc. How all these things give a different context to the sector. I am stopping here in order to give the floor to let me just stop sharing this thing. Um, thank you for 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 listening to that. Hopefully, it raises some thoughts. And I would now like to 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 give the floor to. Mrs. Sabine Langer, who, from reading her biography, very nicely sits in between industry, science, and research, because this is a very great part of what our event uh, is about. And I believe that she's going to give us some deeper and useful and practical insights about measuring, monitoring, analyzing, and that would be a nice, deeper introduction into the topic. The floor is yours, Sabine. Thank you. Um, hi, hello. Thank you very much. Um, I, I'm just going to share my presentation with you now. Let me see if that works. Um, so. That was a, a really good and useful uh, um, introduction, really, and I think I've, I slot actually quite well into that, so that's really good. <laughs> um, you can all see my presentation? Yes, okay, I see some nods, that's perfect. Excellent. Okay, so um, hello, everyone. Um, uh, I would like to talk today about the monitoring challenges and solutions that um, uh, the water industry is facing. Um, and uh, how we can work towards practical and sustainable measurement technologies. Um, so I just, uh, it's always really, you never meet people, so I just uh, put myself there. <laughs> um, and uh, just to explain my background, um, so my background is in biotechnology, technical chemistry, and um, I then specialized in analyt analytical environmental chemistry, which is what I did my PhD in. Um, and uh, I worked in academia for a while and worked as an assistant professor in the UK. Um, and uh, I, and specifically, I have experience in the analysis of lipids, oil-derived chemicals, pharmaceuticals, micro nanoplastics, so all that kind of set in, in aqueous environments. So that includes the ocean and, um, um, and also um, a more inland uh, aqueous environment. Um, I found academia as very fascinating and uh, very interesting, but I kind of wanted to, I was always really frustrated that um, it was very difficult to bring solutions um, to be actually applied in uh, real life situations to actually bring them to market. Uh, there's lots of barriers in academia. We, we don't really have the time or the infrastructure to do that. So um, at the beginning of the year, I, I moved to a position at uh, an institute called Silicon Austria Labs, where I'm now a senior scientist and work in the sensor systems uh, department and specialize on chemical sensors and biosensors. Um, so Silicon Austria Labs is new, that's, that's why I need to introduce this. <laughs> Um, so it's an, a research organization that is founded by the Austrian government, really, um, and it focuses on translating science to industrial applications. And it's growing to, it's for it, the plan is to grow to 360 researchers. We're now like maybe 150, um, in the locations of Graz, Linz, uh, and Villach, um, so three locations in Austria. And we do funded research, so we we work with funding agencies like FFG, which is the Austrian uh, technology 
agency, but also um, EU project, EU funding. But we also have a very unique funding model, and I need to highlight that because maybe there's some people might be interested in that. And that's we have cooperative projects, which is where um, we work with industry um, and we give a 50% match. So basically that's 50 50 funded projects and we have 140 million euros available for that so um that's a really op an opportunity with little bureaucracy to get into uh, a funded research project and we also do just uh, plain commissioned research and uh, yeah okay so um so my background is obviously um measuring things in water um and uh the types that are the contaminants in water that are as uh, just nice kind of to summarize that I think um, there are manifold from 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 a chemical perspective. This is um, really particularly um, from a chemical perspective, they are really, really varied. So there's uh, lots of different uh, uh, types of uh, contaminants that you can get from a chemical compound side. But if you would summarize them, you would probably say there's um, the organic load, so the amount of organics in total that is in there. Um, then we have pathogens, so that's biological um, agents. Um, we have uh, we have metals. Um, we have fertilizer, so from from runoff, that's an anthropo anthropogenic. We have oil derived chemicals, so chemicals um, which uh, come uh, from uh, oil processing. We have pharmaceuticals. Um, we have industrial products. Um, we have uh, disinfection uh, byproducts, um, and we have pesticides. So now, um, if we take a look at um, the uh, water um cycle the problems that we have um are really in particular um so if you see here you have those ones are the ones that are classically a problem in drinking water and in all of drinking water pretty much um so we have organic load that can happen everywhere. We can have pathogens even in the water I live in Filach. So our water does come from the mountains. So that's you know really nice and clean. But even there, we have path we have pathogens in there because um, uh, you know you can have a deer that dies in the river or whatever. Um, you can have metals. Metals are people always think that they are just coming from um, industrial activities, but metals are a huge um, natural contaminant as well. They're not only anthropogenic, um, uh, especially in particular mining areas um, that is high in certain metals like silver or lead, for example. Um, arsenic is really high, so arsenic is a priority pollutant, and that doesn't necessarily need to be actually um, coming from um, any anthropogenic activity. And that's obviously disinfection byproducts when uh, water is being chlorinated and um, there's a leftover disinfection product. So now these other contaminants that I've put here in brown are obviously the ones that are supposedly going into the second section, which is the sewage water. Um, because those are the ones that uh, are in the water after we've used the water. Um, and the, they are also not only in, in that, they are also in groundwater. So they can seep in, for example, from fields into the groundwater as well. Um, so that is why they also become a drinking problem, a drinking water problem, because we reuse this water. Um, the, the contaminants seep into the groundwater. So actually, even though they're primarily a wastewater problem, um, and, and environmentally toxic, they also become a drinking water problem if we kind of reuse this. So, in fact, while the priority pollutants are probably organic load pathogens and metals in drinking water, actually, we need to take a look at all the different pollutants um, in different scenarios. So this is an example uh, of some stuff that I have worked on, and these are Canadian oil sands after oil processing in Canada. The water is being dumped that's being used for the oil processing is being dumped in huge ponds next to a river, for example, 
this is in Athabasca, this is the Athabasca River, and these are the tailing spawns. And it's only separated from this river by sand dikes. Um, and um, yeah, this is Athabasca River, so it, it kind of looks very close. You can see this. <clears throat> the sand dikes are leaking sometimes. And you can see here, for example, it has environmental toxicity. So this is the cumulative number of eggs of um, uh, of a special fish um, a, that was exposed to these chemicals and the blue arrow points to the natural cumulative number of eggs and then you can see at the time of uh, dumping these uh, chemicals in the uh, time zero the the fish stops reproducing but uh, at the same time while this is environmental as soon as it gets into groundwater this becomes a drinking water issue as well um, so there are obviously water quality standards, um, which are all uh, EU and EU national standards, but you know all of that. And they have focused on the priority pollutants of E. coli, arsenic and fluoride. And you can see, for example, here as a summary, the number of violations uh, in the US summarized are generally kind of quite well distributed over these priority pollutants and then some other pollutants, a lot of them also, for example, like radionuclides. Um, and on a global scale, this is important to understand this because obviously poorest and rural areas are most affected by the lack of drinking waters. Um, and we can't scale, we can't estimate the scale of the problem. And that's where the analytical chemistry comes in, because we we actually don't know how the how big the problem is until we measure it. So things only um, get better once we can uh, understand what the extent of them is. And this is also where the analytical challenges for this assessment come in, because this is not easy to analyze. For the microbiology, you need a microbiological lab, you need time, you need to grow microorganisms for seven days or um, uh, in the lab in order to enumerate them and count them. And for the chemistry, um, most of the time, you also need a laboratory procedure or a procedure that even uses toxic chemicals um, in order to um, uh, um, estimate these chemical parameters appropriately. So the areas that need the most, which are the poorest and rural areas, um, have least access to these facilities and to these laboratory facilities. Um, and they have least uh, possibility of actually measuring these. In Canada, these would be native um, native, uh, native Canadians, so First Nation communities, but obviously in every other area, um, uh, in every other country, this is kind of different community. Okay, so the monitoring challenges here are that the most important parameters are generally measured offline. So the microbiology, you use plating methods. Um, for the organic load, you use a method called chemical biological oxygen demand, in which you take a sample, you digest it with the potassium dichromate, you heat it, and then you put it there, and you wait until it uh, changes the color, and then you can measure the color, maybe photometrically, or you have to titrate it. So this is that kind of um, uh, yeah, a, a complex procedure, which has been automated a bit more, but you still have to do it. Um, and then there's chemicals such as nitrate, chlorine, arsenic, or pH. And for these ones, you can do those colorimetric, colorimetrically, like shown on the bottom right. But there are also now more and more sensor uh, solutions available that, so that you don't have to do it offline. But for arsenic, for example, this is still very difficult. Um, so there is a complete and very clear need. And there's also lots of scope for online solutions. We're only talking about priority pollutants here, but there's also all these other pollutants that we talked about. And for this, um, the most interesting uh, to use is of course sensors. Um, so what is a sensor? Um, a sensor converts a change in the environment into an electrical signal. So we have sensors that measure physical properties. So temperature, conductivity, radiation, um, like light, for example, um, and sensors that work with chemical properties. Um, and those would be, for example, pH or oxygen content or salinity. And here at the bottom, I'm showing a typical sensor that works with optical principles and that can measure some chemical properties um, uh, quite well. For example, it measures the UV absorption, so that's physical chemical, really. 
Um, these sensors um, are available. They're good. Unfortunately, they're really, really expensive and they are not actually very good at measuring specific things. Um, so their specificity isn't very good. So they can give you kind of a bit of an overview of a parameter, but it's very difficult to link it to um, any of these contaminants directly sometimes. And uh, the other side of sensors, and this is the one that uh, we are kind of working on, is bio and chemo sensors. So we're working on, so Silicon Austria is also working on the other side of sensors, but the ones that I'm particularly interested in is the bio and chemo sensors. And these are particularly interesting because obviously you have um, a sensing layer and then you have a transducer, you have electronics uh, that converts it to, into an electrical signal. And the sensing layer is a, is a layer that can be specific to any different biochemical target, like chemicals, bacteria, toxin, viruses, and so on and so on. So in, in principle, you would have the scope if you produce the right sensing layer um, to measure anything you want. Uh, the transducer then, uh, the sensing layer is then changed somehow uh, by this uh, absorption of this biochemical target into a, and, and a property of it is changed. So that could be an electrical property. Um, it could be an optical property. Um, it could be, um, uh, um, it could be, for example, that an electron is produced. So we're actually producing a current. Um, and so on and so on. And this is what the transducer is um, has to do. So it has to um, change that uh, signal of the binding into a signal that can be read out by electronics. And then obviously we need the electronics and then the electrical signal and the data processing. So the technical challenges really in water sensing are the analytes. So we have the different analytes like Legionella, microplastics, pesticides, and so on. There are physical challenges. So if you use metal sensors, um, you can get obviously corrosion um, quite easily. The matrix is difficult, particularly in wastewater. In potable water, it's more that with the concentrations are so low. So the matrix is usually a lot easier because it's clean. Um, and salinity, for example. Um, and then we have the problem of the environment. When we're actually measuring online and in line, we have, we're working with quite a high flow and a high pressure of the water we need to adapt to. Um, so, um, hang on. There we go. And then there are the implementation challenges. So for sensors, the real problem is really to get them accurate if they are deployed in the lines and they're there for a year or something and you can't get to them. How do you maintain calibration and um, how do you maintain this accuracy? Um, how then the stability, um, what I've shown you before, the biosensors, for example, the chemo sensors, the sensing layer is usually classically an antibody um, or a bit of DNA. But um, this is not very stable and the cost and sustainability. So the devices are either very expensive, like in the tens of thousands um, and durable, or they're single use devices and they're unsustainable because you have them and then you throw them away again. So what what we do in the in the research unit that we work on um, is we work on um, sensor solutions, kind of, so from the beginning, uh, so from the from the um, from the design, really, to uh, to the testing um, of these solutions, and uh, we do two things. So we work with commercially available components um, uh, that use kind of wired, inductive, or near field communication, so you can read out these sensors as well, and that uh, use low power. Um, and we also work on sustainable sensors where we try to use printed technologies, um, uh, hybrid integration, um, but we also have capacity for microfabrication. So this is an example for a solution. Um, uh, so for example, the problem with uh, metal sensors is that they are um, not very sustainable, they corrode um, and they're prone to, to biofouling. 
So uh, we work with uh, something that is called laser-induced graphene. So that's, um, hang on, I, I can show you how this is done. So that's a laser that, if you can see the video, that sometimes doesn't play very well in the PowerPoint and the uh, WebEx stuff. But um, uh, the, that laser kind of makes really on the uh, substrate that you give it, that can be a polymer, um, it, it produces graphene. Um, and this uh, uh, this graphene uh, can be an electrode. So this, what is printed here, for example, it shows you that's an electrode that can be used for impedometric sensing. So that's a really versatile sensor technique. And then on this graphene, you can chemically modify this and put a chemically um, a chemical sensor on this graphene, and then you can detect, for example, changes in the electrical fields by the impedometric. Uh, um, uh, sensing or impedance spectroscopy. Um, and this can be done, for example, for temperature or for chemicals or for flow or for force or for bending and so on and so on. Um, another solution that I think is, is really going to be the solution to a lot of these problems um, is, and in particular, the stability that is provided by, that is given by the antibodies, is to use biomimetic detection rather than actual antibodies. Um, so this is uh, molecularly imprinted polymers. So that's a polymer where you have uh, is the, the analyte, you po polymerize it while the analyte is present. And you produce a polymer that is imprinted exactly with the shape of the analyte. And this is a technology that's been around for about 20 years, but it's, uh, it's now really coming to, so it's been invented probably 20 years ago, but it's really now only coming into maturity. Um, uh, and it's really exciting because it has the opportunity, it gives you the opportunity to sense all types of different um, substrates, uh, uh, analytes um, on these kind of, uh, for example, laser scribed substrates, like I've shown you before on this electrode. And um, uh, it's, it's really good because um, it's it's much more stable than antibodies, so you can kind of it's a polymer, so um, it doesn't degrade like an antibody would in a harsh environment or all the time. Um, and this is an example of what we've done for a detection of phthalates in water and beverages. Um, and it is possible, you know, to uh, it is possible to do that and to use that for it. Um, and there's another set of challenges, and that is really the autonomous network, autonomous sensing network. Because when you want to have a sensing network, you don't want it to just walk around and measure it. So what you want to do really is to have something that collects all the data and then just tells you what's going on. Um, and those are, again, a whole new different set of challenges in the future. And that's, first of all, energy. How are you going to power the sensor if it's in the water? You can't really stick a battery inside very easily, or you can, but you have to seal it and the battery will stop, and so on and so on. So they need quite a bit of power. They have, uh, there's the security problem. So the data is being transmitted, the data is being processed, but how are you going to stop anyone from hacking into your system if you set it out and all your pipelines over, for example, Sofia? Um, and then we have the coverage and connectivity uh, challenges. So these are really the kind of uh, more electronic slash IT challenges where you have to have like a wireless network and, you know, wireless is, is not so easy to actually have um, continuous coverage everywhere and for everything to have a plug-in point. This might not be such a problem in a city environment, but it is, of course, a huge problem in an environment, for example, like I've shown you before, the Canada where it's the First Nations, where there's really actually no cell phone connectivity or no wireless network and everything just works via satellite. Um, so in this, I think so Silicon Australabs is actually super well placed um, to to kind of be uh, uh, to address these challenges in a holistic way because we are in uh, we have to, so I'm in the sensor systems unit and we work with sensor systems can do microfabrication clean room stuff but also the printable flexible sustainable stuff. Um, but we also have a number of different other units. We have power electronics, so they work with powering stuff. Um, we have RF technology. They work with wireless power, but also wireless transmission. 
um, system integration technologies. So they put everything kind of together and embedded systems and they work on AI. So even though we're not an institute that is kind of working for water network sensing, um, we have uh, a whole set of skills that we can put together, you know, mix and match. So we don't work just in our research unit. We, we can mix and match from every research unit with people who have the skills to put it together, to put projects together. Um, so um, we are really working on a, a, a number of different uh, uh, approaches and proposals to this water system. And here's just a suggestion, a quick one, where I can show you. So for example, this is for Legionella. Um, so Legionella is obviously a big, uh, big pathogen problem uh, also in clean, presumably clean drinking water because it's everywhere and it grows at 20 degrees. This is only getting worse with climate change because as your pipes are in the ground, the ground warms up and the pipes will warm up. Um, and it can only get rid of by heating it for, for prolonged time periods to really quite high temperature, which costs a lot of energy. And obviously it disrupts the whole system because you can't use water that's 50 degrees hot at the time. Um, so one thing, one way to counteract that is to use proxy sensors. So sensors that measure temperature, UV flow, all things that are conducive to Legionella growth. Um, and then to network them together and find out when, you know, you are likely to be liable to have, likely to have a Legionella growth. <clears throat> you can, but also what you need at the same time is an electronic biosensor that can actually detect Legionella growth online in the system. And then you need to network that together using data processing, machine learning systems um, in order to create the water safety plan. And then what you also need is an actual control measurement um, where you have a rec rapid, accurate and sensitive at line measurement. So you can actually um, uh, you can actually verify what your sensors have told you. Um, and then the last uh, resort are the traditional methods, which everyone needs to do at certain time periods anyways, due to all the uh, um, all the norm standards like European norm, etc. Um, and all those should talk together with feedback and create a water safety plan <laughs> that uh, should uh, work in a holistic way to kind of assess the whole system. So proxy sensors um, and uh, that record temperature, UVVs and so on, um, which record the Legionella related parameters. And then, hang on, let me go through this again. And then the online detection, for example, using this molecular, which is what we're working on using this molecularly imprinted polymer that can detect Legionella actually um, <clears throat> directly and read it out electronically using a chip um, that uh, can be powered wirelessly, for example, um, or that uses just very, very little power. So it can stay there for a long time. So the water monitoring market is actually really big. Um, the growth forecast is about um, five to seven percent over the next um, three to five years, and it has this complex and unique set of challenges that is should that you can kind of really address with just very large consortia and um, very large um, holistic uh, views on the system. Uh, it's a focal point, obviously, of UN EU strategies, and the challenges include uh, a number of different uh, areas and research areas. Um, and we're kind of, uh, we are trying to work with partners who are involved in every part of this process. So make, deploy, analyze, and apply. Okay, so thank you for listening. <laughs> I hope that was useful. I think it's really interesting discussion. So <laughs> Thank you very much, Sabine. I mean, I expected that you will get deep into things, but you kind of, Went even deeper. Okay, sorry. Um, really good, re really useful presentation. I mean, I particularly like the uh, explanation of how biosensors work. Uh, I think people like you should get on TV to explain how vaccines work, <laughs> but particularly <laughs> in countries like Bulgaria, <laughs> even if it's not your exact field. But um, <laughs> Really, I mean, it's uh, both uh, interesting in view of the collaborative model between science funding and uh, 
um, application for, 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 for the various industries and uh, particularly in the context of the uh, resilience and recovery facility mechanisms around Europe, what you are doing in uh, uh, Silicon Austria Labs is uh, a useful model, but uh, the very technical and technological and scientific aspects that you explained on censoring and monitoring are also leading us to some conclusion for sure. Thank you for that. And uh, now I would like to quickly pass the floor to a person I have the pleasure and honor to know well, Professor Atanasu from uh, um, from from Sofia, from the uh, Joint Genomic Center, and a uh, number of other institutions that he has presented. So, Professor Atanasu, the floor is yours on an interesting topic that will link water technologies and agriculture, I believe. Thank you very much. Uh, it is uh, my pleasure also to attend in this interesting and challenging uh, uh, meeting. Uh, so, according to the title, uh, I will try to cover the most important issue related with the water scarcity and thus with the water use efficiency, how this reflects on the uh, on the crop production and the food supply. So, in, uh, if you if you look at uh, the humanity uh, millennium uh, problems, in the perspective of the agro industry uh, future, the water is probably the most important along the food because food cannot be produced without water. But it's easily to understand that uh, all the other uh, issues, uh, energy, education. Uh, Biodiversity and everything else is strongly related uh, with uh, the agro uh, industry. Uh, so, if you look at the future in the the strategy for uh, economic uh, development, the green economy, what uh, the Europe uh, actually claims to have uh, like uh, like a uh, goal number uh, number one, it's again without water. It's you cannot consider the rest. So water is on the base of the nature in the base. That's mean all the production of uh, food, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so Sean is telling us this. to book here. Sorry for the moment. Yes. Okay, so if you uh, look at if you look at the future, uh, uh, it is uh, already well recognized that uh, the world should uh, meet the future in the 2050 with twice less water, labor, and so on. And so it's again, again, water is just to emphasize how important is uh, is actually this. So, in the perspective of the or the look at the program uh, Copernic. Uh, okay, so if the water resources uh, are going to decline 40% uh, annually in the 17 countries where 25% of the population is, is living. This is just to show that uh, again, water is a uh, Okay. So as a whole, uh, uh, the the sea of uh, salty water is uh, dominating uh, with a 97% uh, and only 2.5% is the is the fresh uh, the fresh water. And from the, uh, the this fresh uh, water. Uh, we have to deal and we have to know how to use it in the in the future the 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 water the sweet water which is 20% in the lakes and 68% is the groundwater so this is just to show that uh, how how we are going to to meet uh, because the agriculture if you turn again back to the agriculture you can see that averagely all over the world we need Averagely, 70% of the fresh water is going to be used by the agriculture. 
the most efficient is in Europe, in the rest of the world, but it does not mean that uh, uh, that uh, we solved the, the problem because the water consumptions anyhow, it doesn't who is, who is uh, participating in this, uh, uh, the population will grow less than the water consumption. Uh, so again, uh, if you look at the agriculture, uh, uh, water use is the most important in any type of the agricultural. So a number of uh, solutions among which I will talk about the new agricultural uh, practices, uh, digitalization, uh, the new bomb breeding techniques, uh, underutilized crops and uh, epigenetics will be part of my talk in the future. So if we like to satisfy the plant breeding programs, the pre plant breeders already put the enormous styles that way to, to, to have to deal that we need much more uh, surface, um, uh, which more global water demands of the water for the plant breeding purposes will be a battle for water. And we have to consider this issue very, very seriously. And uh, that's why behind this are coming the solutions. So because in a, such a short talk, we cannot cover all the options, but some of the strategic options, which I already mentioned, I will talk about this, but the agronomic options are also um, are very important with the new agricultural practices and the structural and technology options, which part of it has been covered by Sabine in the previous uh, talk. So uh, if you look at uh, the classical breeding, we started 10, a thousand years ago and the 94 starts genetic engineering with us in the space of the GMO is it's already a part of the history. So now the world is meeting the new era of, uh, of the new practices, so-called genome, genome practices, which are actually covering from the genome, from the DNA, transcriptomics, RNA, proteomics, uh, protein level and metabolic levels. So not everything have will return out to be depend entirely from the DNA inheritance, ego from the genes. So environment is uh, turned out to be exclusively important to determine how the, uh, how the uh, agricultural uh, characters of the number of crops depending strongly from the environmental conditions. And I will, I will stop to the orientation how the genome with, uh, with uh, uh, epigenomes can meet uh, the future much more, uh, much more properly in this perspective. So if you look at the biodiversity and uh, water management uh, and the soil management and the food quality and safety, what, uh, what we need now actually as an urgent uh, task. So if you start from the biodiversity point of view, we have a great expectations because only 1% of the 6 million available species have been some, somehow described and a little bit used for the breeding purposes. So if you like to actually to see the future, we have to, you have to discover that uh, we, we need the old traditional crops. We need also the, uh, the crops, the present crops, uh, which are is nowadays and also non-utilized crops. So we have a, a great options. And here is coming the new uh, genomics era uh, to study uh, all the availability in the gene banks. And for example, IPG, Gatterschlepp in Germany is a good example to start with 22,000 barley accessions to be studied and to see which accessions in the present climatic condition changes can be used in the most appropriate way uh, for the near uh, future. So by high throughput uh, sequencing and high throughput mutagenesis, actually we again have much more uh, uh, ground base, solid ground base to study what is behind, what are the common, what is the, uh, what is the specificity of the genes between the different, uh, within one species, one, uh, one crop and uh, between them and uh, what is common, what is different between them. And then we know how eventually 
uh, this uh, could be combined uh, like a, uh, like a field crops or vegetables, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the capacity that we have and the, and the technology which has been developed starting from the field with a very simple apparatus similar to IT uh, phones, so we can isolate the DNA, put it there automatically, and then we can sequencing uh, uh, for the for the very short time uh, the the species is that doesn't matter plant animals etc. And then we can assemble them and we can pair them with the different problems. With the capacity of the supercomputers, then can be put everything in place to compare and then to compare the databases and uh, to eventually make a conclusions which is the best, for example, to be used for water purposes. This can be uh, extensively extended uh, by the new gene editing uh, techniques like the CRISPR Cas. I'm not going to talk to all of them, but again, using the natural capacity of the living system, ego bacterial, how the bacterial fight against the viruses. Uh, we use this natural capacity, and nowadays uh, the modern uh, genomics uh, uh, techniques is using uh, the possibilities, the CRISPR cas by using RNAs with the Cas enzymes to go to defined place and to cut it, and then we can make a point mutation. Uh, we can uh, also uh, start to regulate it and control. Uh, the uh, the transcription uh, level, uh, which uh, actually is related to the epigenome, uh, which I'm uh, uh, which I mentioned in a in a minute, and produce a number of mutant lines, and then to study the normal with the mutation, and to know what uh, from which uh, factor which gene differ, uh, uh, what uh, threats agronomic threats are determined by them. That's mean. Uh, we can go and to study very well uh, functional genomics, etc. So if we compare, because the people are mixed uh, with the GMO technologies, uh, GMO is just to enter uh, to, to to transfer another gene from another species. Here within one species, we can manipulate manipulate the genes and to make their expression better, or to replace one with another, or to stop, or to stimulate or to promote. Uh, uh, the the function, but compared with the GMOs, uh, the GMOs is uh, is uh, concerning one gene uh, from uh, from outside. Uh, the, but with the CRISPR cas actually we in uh, artificial intelligence application, we actually can uh, make a, a, a whatever uh, uh, we can uh, 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 manipulate within one species of the genome of one species. And this is enormous potential uh, for the future. So the goal with the new genome techniques is spending five dollars to have a return in the 15 ones. So uh, again, uh, here, uh, uh, for example, uh, creating this uh, with one species, for example, it doesn't matter. This is a cultivated one. If you like it to, to see, uh, for example, the wild uh, species with the uh, uh, the wild varieties with the new varieties, uh, uh, we can understand uh, easily uh, by methylation of, uh, of the, the genes, whether within variety fits to the, defer, the, to the defined uh, climate. And that's mean uh, we can realize the potential of this variety better in one region than the other, because uh, this very much depends on the environmental, the expression of the genes, it depends, they determine the expression of the genes in the defined condition, especially if we talk about uh, the, the water, the water scarcity, that means uh, we have to deal and we have to know the genes which are related with the heat and drought uh, resistance. And this is, that's, uh, uh, the epigenome uh, actually is giving the new chance. This capacity of the epigenome can be extended if we consider the other important in the new area of the development. This is the microbiome. Microbiomes is the new area of the of the biology uh, development, and this is the uh, microbiome is everywhere. It's in the soil, 
that's mean it is within the plant and that's that's mean in interacted each other the same with the animals and the humans and it, it is can be very easily if you destroy the balance of the nature so that's why the COVID 19, 19 appears in the human because uh, one host should be replaced from the other the same with the plant microbiome so if we deal properly if we know uh, for example the microbiome uh, like cytopores, microrhiza, et cetera, et cetera. That's mean how we know how the plant genes interact the microbial genes and how they help each other with this type of symbiosis and what hamper or what make the promotion of the, uh, of the plant growth and uh, productivity. So the microbiome, according to my understanding, is uh, one of the future that can deter the plant productivity uh, much better than, uh, than now. With uh, quantum computers, that's just extended. That is already being shown that, uh, in, especially in the area of the pharmacy, uh, you can study the all the, in parallel or simultaneously all the possible proteins within uh, one, uh, one, uh, one living uh, uh, system and to understand which proteins are important for the discovery of the different uh, drugs. It doesn't matter if these are plants or uh, animals or uh, micro microorganisms. Uh, and uh, from this point of view, the, the, the present uh, situation and the, and the near uh, uh, future is related with the metabolomics. So, those which are uh, practical sometimes are thinking that uh, instead to go to starting from the genes, you look at the phenotype or the final product, which are the, the meta metabolomes. These are uh, secondary compounds, which are the low molecular weight, which determine actually the healthy situation. And I'm saying this because sometimes a number of metabolomes are also related with the water uh, water uh, scarcity, or that's mean with the drought uh, resistance or heat resistance in plants. And then we can very easily understand uh, which are those compounds which are related and to start the metabolomic selection, not uh, the gene selection, because metabolomes are the finally products which determine tolerance or sensitivity to uh, one character or the other. So the first management is related uh, mostly with uh, so-called uh, so another uh, artificial intelligence and digitalization, uh, which is uh, uh, related to the satellite systems, drones, etc. So with this present situation with the satellite, actually we can control in a such a way the fields that. Uh, for example, uh, the meteorological system is showing that tomorrow will will uh, rain, but it is the much better satellite to show that we don't need to irrigate at uh, at present situation this field, but you irrigate the other, and then we can save the water uh, in the, the same with the rest. But as far as the water is concerning, is important. So I would like to give it a. a, a uh, two examples, and one is related to the so-called microbiome, is using the microorganisms in the combination so-called extra soap uh, product, which is compound of six different uh, bacterial strains, which are starting from nitrogen and uh, plant protecting uh, bacteria, finishing with plant protecting, is giving a chance to stimulate the plant, the plant growth and uh, productivity uh, in a different. Uh, ways by spraying, the, by treating the seeds, and then during the vegetative stages, you treat it uh, once or twice, and this giving you the, the chance actually to, uh, to replace the chemical fertilizers and also the pesticides. So uh, I would like with this uh, to finish because what I was trying to say that uh, without uh, technology progress, without applying the genomics, without applying uh, all the rest omics, 
or the even the nowadays so-called yonomis, which are the macro and micro element. And uh, if you don't apply the gene editing techniques to show how the genomics is related with transcriptomics, proteomics, metabolomics, and finally phenomics, which is the final uh, product, and how it determines on the environmental factor, so-called epigenomics, and how this can be easily developed with the database and uh, with by the application of the new quantum computers, application of supercomputers, the future is uncertain. So the new technology, without what I'm trying to say, without new technology, actually the pro progress will be none or very little. So it is, I would like to finish, thank you. And uh, I wish success further on, on the, this important uh, conference. And thank you again. Thank you, Professor Adonasu. It was a pleasure as usual. Um, time is up, but I want to take the chance to ask two very quick questions to both uh, Sabine and Professor Adonasu. Sabine, sure. the, Sabine, the yeah. one to you, um is which is the top pollutant which is outside the list of required um, laboratory analysis at the moment i mean potable water uh, testing requirements in the european union which you believe should be tracked and why that's a good question um that's outside the list. Um, I mean, the top priority pollutant list, for example, it, it only includes E. coli yeah. as, as bacteria, so as the pathogen. So I think um, uh, I think Legionella is another pathogen that I think rivals E. coli. Not in numbers, though in Europe at least, um, but I think it will in the future due to climate change and kind of the warming of the pipes and stuff. Um, the ones that I think are really emerging, I would say I, I don't think I could pick a single one because it really depends on the situation that you're in. Um, and water is so variable, obviously, depending on, you know, the, the, the area, the location and the source of the water. So I think for groundwater, it would certainly be uh, uh, pesticides uh, that need to be tracked. I think for municipal um, recycled water, it should certainly be pharmaceuticals that could range from estrogens over NSAIDs to antivirus and antibiotics. Um, I think for areas like um, uh, um, uh, areas that, for example, have a possibility of um, much algal growth. It should be algal micro microtoxins, um, uh, so algal, al algal toxins, which are, uh, I think, often overlooked because they are natural pollutants. So I think that's a really difficult say because there's no single one one pollutant that you can really track. Uh, but there's a lot of emerging ones that I think, depending on the water source, would need to be. Um, would need to be uh, monitored and monitoring solutions for those implemented. And that's, I think, why it is so interesting and exciting to have the possibility to develop sensors that are sensitive to, that are easy to adapt to different analytes. So I think the main challenge for sensors in this new kind of um, age of monitoring really is to have adaptable layers that you can, depending on what you need to monitor, adapt to different things. So, for example, we have um, here a whole set of, uh, we work with a co water company, they monitor, they have like 200 customers and, and everyone has a completely different requirement. Everyone does something different. One of them has to measure arsenic because of their well, and one of them has to measure this, you know, it, it's very, very variable. So, that, yes. <laughs> and for wastewater, of course, we should measure COVID, but I think you have a whole talk on this later. <laughs> yep, we have. Thank you very much. That was uh, quite exhaustive. Uh, I'll, I'll take your answer as pharmaceuticals and uh, uh, pesticides, <laughs> because it's to, to remember it more easily. Uh, very quick final question, Professor Adanasov, to you, and um, I would uh, ask you to be really quick in your response. Uh, 
my question is the following. Uh, there has been a lot of speculation in recent years about uh, rice that is being grown with sea, uh, with saline water, with salty water. Do you believe some of the conventional crops in Europe, like maize, for example, or soybean, or even wheat, can in the coming years be grown by using salty water? Thank you. <laughs> it's a quite provocative question. Uh... Mr. Rousseff, uh, but uh, yes, we have to think it's 97% um, of water is salty water and the scarcity is becoming a serious problem. And uh, uh, so, yes, uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, Israel already made the desalinated uh, water in order to be used for the agricultural purposes. But uh, this is uh, one of the solutions. The other solution, which is uh, could be uh, much more Im important, is to see how we can uh, make a combination or compatibility of the present soil or the or the sandy soils with the different uh, compounds and with the salty water. What what is within the salty water? So this is, should be should be, I think, uh, in the future, a combination of the breeding and genomic techniques to make the, the plants compatible with uh, such a combination, the new combination, or whether we can make the plants uh, uh, simply tolerant to the very much salty, because in the salty water, we have a number of compounds which determine the living system of, it doesn't matter what they are, microbiomes or algae, or et cetera. So the yes, uh, the the future will show better, but I'm pretty sure that uh, the science is already there and seriously is thinking uh, uh, whether and how this can be practically utilized in a very near time. So this is my approximate answer. Thank you very much. Thank you both yeah. for the answers, for the participations, and for the uh, interesting insights. Uh, that was everything for our first panel, Potable Water and Biotechnologies. Uh, we are a bit behind schedule, but I think it was worthwhile. Uh, let me close this panel and now a very, very short break, something like five minutes. So please be around at 11.5 uh, Central European time when my uh, colleague and friend Valentin Nikol will open and moderate the second uh, panel. Thank you. Let's take a short break.
Ну, кстати. So, hello to everybody once more after the short break. My name is Valentin Nikolov, and uh, I would like to uh, thank uh, the organizers and all the guests uh, for uh, making this wonderful event and for showing up. Uh, in this uh, session, we will uh, touch on uh, several um, uh, in, on several ways in which uh, science and technologies allow us to utilize uh, more efficiently wastewater. Uh, the guests uh, will uh, share some of their experience, including how we can better clean wastewater of the contaminants, how we can recover valuable uh, elements from it, and also how we can harvest important information. I will go straight to Professor uh, Gubit, uh, who is a, a professor at the University of, uh, University of National Natural Resources and Life Sciences in Vienna. Uh, he will uh, talk about um, enzymatic degradation of plastics. And uh, uh, I would like to say that uh, Professor Gubit uh, has uh, limited time uh, to be here with us. So uh, at 11.30 he will leave and maybe we will have one or two questions if, if there is time just shortly before he leaves. So Professor Gelbitz, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks a lot. So I will try to share my screen right now. Can you see everything? Yeah? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, Good, so, so welcome to my presentation on enzymes for plastic degradation. So I'll introduce you a little bit to, to what enzymes are and um, how we can use them to degrade plastics. And finally, of course, um, that uh, these enzymes are produced by microbes that, that will also uh, be present or can be added to wastewater treatment systems. On this first slide, you can see our new lab building. Um, it's fully made out of wood and um, we feel very well in this building, so it has a nice climate and it's, of course, also sustainable and made from renewable resources. Um, we are located with my department a little bit outside of Vienna in a, in a small city called Tulln, and we are hosting uh, different institutes range, ranging from analytics to biotechnology, environmental biotechnology and so forth. So, and on the overall campus, we are focusing on bioresources and technologies with over a thousand people in different um, institutes. All right, so this is uh, one essential slide. So if we are talking about plastics in water or in the environment, we first have to ask where they come from. So you all know already uh, from, from many presentations and the literature that we have, of course, plastics like the bottles that just enter the environment because they are thrown out. And we have plastics that we don't see that much. So that's more the microplastics. And that can result from several processing. So I won't show you all the distribution. But one of the processes where we generate uh, microplastics is the washing of textiles. This is already well known, but it is uh, less known that um, it is uh, thousands of tons of plastic that we send to the rivers and to the wastewater treatment plants just from the washing process. Here's a study um, from uh, the Falco, and they have uh, shown that depending on the material, the composition, um, um, various amounts of microplastics are released during washing. So this is all polyesters. But as you can see here, it's, it's almost 350 milligrams per kilogram of textile that is washed. So that's a huge amount, yeah? So if uh, you were cer wash certain textiles like this fleece jacket, you will even notice that they are getting less and less in weight. And all this is going to the environment. Um, a couple of years ago, we had a study um, in, in Vienna 
um, from colleagues and they found out that in the Danube River we already have more plastics particles than fish larvae and uh, just last year in cooperation with the medical university it was found out that even in our body in our excrement we can find microplastics already so today i will show you two things one i hope i can uh, transfer this that we should just uh, produce less of the plastics in the environment and the other thing is talking a little about a bit about enzymes uh, what they can do um, why enzymes? So essentially, if we are talking about polymeric substances, they are always degraded by enzymes outside the cell. So if it's a biodegradation, so that the microbes, let it be bacteria or fungi, they cannot eat the whole polymer, but they secrete enzymes that uh, do or start the degradation outside the cell. And only then um, the microbes can um, eat the, the small components that are then resulting. Um, yeah, and if we are talking to, to the engineering companies, they always ask us why enzymes or microbes, that's all, that's all dangerous, but I always show this picture here, that it's a, a human body, and you might all know that about five liters of uh, bacteria are in our body. And the point is now there, they have many functions, but one important function is to degrade polymeric um, constituents of our food. So even in our mouth, we already have uh, bacteria that produce enzymes like amylases that can help to degrade our food. So yes, um, enzymes and microbes are natural and, and we can use them, or should use them more also to degrade uh, toxins in the environment. If we move to plastics, uh, so the plastic bottle here is uh, one of the representatives of, of a lot of packaging materials that enter the environment. So we have about 60 um, um, million tons of textile being produced, but only 30 million tons of, 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 of plastic packaging. So it is less, but still it's an important source for environmental pollution. A couple of years ago, um, there was a publication on plastic degradation by microbes. I also gave a comment on that. Um, so that is something that is happening in the environment. But unfortunately, um, in the environment, microbes have much better things to eat. They can eat starch, cellulose, glucose, sugars, many things. So they are not used to eat uh, synthetic plastics like PET, polyethylene, diraphthalate. But yes, if the microbes are conditioned to such substrates, they can produce enzymes which degrade such materials. Very briefly, why using enzymes? So I already mentioned that biodegradation will always start with an enzyme. And if we want to push such pro processes, enzymes are um, biocatalysts, and especially working with them with polymers, there's a lot of advantages as they attack certain materials, but they leave others components of a material unchanged. So we can modify something even in a waste, we can extract something, while the rest will not be uh, affected. I will come back with an example later on. Before moving to the degradation, I always like to, to talk about the four R's. So if we talk about degradation, actually, I want to remind everyone before we uh, discuss end of the pipe solutions, we should start at the beginning of the life cycle. And there it is obviously more important, even much more important to reduce consumption of plastics. Um, a couple of years ago in our supermarkets, um, we found bananas which are um, wrapped in, in synthetic polymers. It was only there for a couple of months because then there was in the social media some kind of a shitstorm because even young people, a lot of young people complained and found out that bananas originally have shells, they have skins, and why removing these and packaging them? Yeah? So it's not on the market anymore, but it shows that there are so many things that we don't need actually. Yeah? So first of all, we should, as scientists, transfer to the society, okay, try to reduce um, the use of, of plastics um, and really consider whether we need it or not. Then the second R is reuse. Of course, whatever we can reuse, let it be textiles or anything else, we should reuse 
before sending it to wastewater or to recycling. And only then in the green cycle that I've made, of course, we should develop recycling processes and also adapt the materials um, in a way that they would be susceptible to recycling. So if today we talk about plastics in wastewater and in, in the environment, the future should be reduced to waste. And if we construct new materials, we design bioplastic based materials, they should degrade in the environment. And if they degrade in the environment, um, we can also um, find out more easily recycling processes, because then it means that we can use biotechnology to decompose the materials and reuse them. Okay, so redesign to make um, materials envir environmentally friendly in the environment, but also to allow us to produce uh, recycling processes. All right, so on this slide, you can see an electron micro, uh, microscopic picture from our labs. Um, the, the yellow stuff is, is polyester and the, the green and, and, and purple stuff are bacteria degrading polyester. So yes, there are microbes that can degrade polyester, as you can see, and we've isolated those and we can produce their enzymes and study those in, in, in plastics degradation. Um, this is an interesting subject, um, and I want to very briefly point out to you um, what for we can use enzymes related to polyesters. So on the left hand side, you see we can um, functionalize polyesters, so we don't degrade them completely. We just do some hydrolysis reaction on the surface. On the right hand side, if we degrade them completely, of course, we can produce a recycling uh, process. Um, there is um, companies in France like Carbius, we have worked with them that claim already that they can degrade completely polyester bottles by using enzymes, which will then result in the building blocks, so terphthalic acid, for example, that can be reused. Um, I will come back to this process, so I personally believe that for recycling purposes, enzymes have even more of a potential for blended materials and mixed wastes. The other methods, when we don't degrade polyesters completely, just for your interest, there is a lot of applications for this process um, that can lead to uh, membranes that have a higher flux, um, textiles with better properties, and, and a lot of applications. Um, which doesn't have to relate to, to degradation, but functionalization under mild conditions. Alrighty, so this is a busy slide, but it's uh, quite important. So uh, a big company asked us um, to find out how um, their polyesters could be degraded faster in a wastewater treatment plants. And uh, we were asked to find out, is there bacteria that are there in these wastewater treatment plants or can, could we even add organisms, so like a bio-augmentation approach to um, make it faster? And we did some in silico search, so we looked for enzymes that could break ester bonds on the computer in databases and we found out that Pseudomonas species, so these two here, Pseudomonas pelagia and Pseudomonas pseudoalkalinicinus, they indeed produce enzymes that break ester bonds of polymeric um, esters. And we designed um, model substrate, so you can see here the terphthalic acid, here um, another acid which is ionic, so this is polymers that are present in many household products, and here you see the alcohol um, moieties. So you can already see here that we are not only looking whatever waste is already there, so we also want to understand which kind of structure would be degraded better and which um, not so good. So this would give very important information to the companies how to make better, more environmentally friendly polymers. And what we found out is, uh, yes, that the enzymes can degrade the polymers and the chain lengths of this middle thing, this alcohol, this diol, plays a major role. And interestingly, this corresponds also if we add the microbes, not only the enzyme, if we add the whole microbe to the uh, polymers, then we get a similar picture. Yeah? And uh, the final thing that companies or even the politics might ask us, so is this then biodegradation? 
So we do the standard biodegradation assay, and yes, these enzymes, this, this result really correlates to biodegradation. And this is highly important. On the one hand, we can say, of course, if we add these microbes to the wastewater or to process water, there it might make sense economically, then we get a better degradation. And whatever um, happens there in terms of degradation, so CO2 evolution, correlates to the enzymes the organisms produced. So yes, the, the whole degradation process goes back to the enzymes that are secreted by these organisms. So maybe this is the most important slides in this uh, presentation related to the session, but I would like to take the opportunity to show you some more um, um, scientific results that we are producing. We can even improve the enzymes. So plastics are often hydrophobic um, and enzymes in nature are more used to hydrophilic polymers like cutin. So we can engineer the enzymes. We attach binding domains and then we get much better um, um, degradation. For example, um, we can also do it like the fungi do in the environment. Uh, they secrete hydrophobins, that's hydrophobic molecules or amphiphilic molecules. And again, with this, we can enhance um, degradation. Yeah, and um, maybe before going to the wastewater, I think, um, as I mentioned, initially recycling is extremely important and thereby enzymes have a major role. Um, for plastics degradation, we are working, as I've shown you, on, on making enzymes better. But um, if we look at um, textiles, for instance, that contain cotton, so or cellulose, cotton, or rayon, um, there we already have very fast enzymes that can be used in recycling. And on this slide, you can see a, a process that we have developed with the companies for recycling of textiles that consists of different components. So it might be cellulose and polyester, so towels or linen has about 50-50 cotton and polyester or other um, flame retardant textiles may com be composed of rayon and aramide. Also additives are in there. So if we talk about plastics in the environment, we should never forget about the additives. For instance, the flame retardant that I'm showing here makes about 20% of the whole um, um, textile. So it's a lot of uh, molecules that we should not forget in, in waste and recycling. Yeah, and, and if we go through the slides, uh, we've used enzymes to remove the textile, uh, the, the cellulose part that can be done by almost 100%. And then we can recycle both the synthetic fibers and the aramid fibers. So this is quite valuable, it costs 20 euros per kilogram, this additive, and the companies could reuse it in the production of new flame retardant fibers. In this case, um, and in other cases, they could produce uh, real fibers. So one um, a summary slide on what we are doing in our labs. Uh, we are trying to find out better microbes, better enzymes in the environment. And we are using a lot of modern uh, biotechnology approaches ranging from proteomics, metagenomics, isolation. So really trying to see what is degrading a certain material in silico screening. And all these uh, we are doing in high throughput with a robotic um, equipment. All right, so um, this was, was my lecture. Uh, unfortunately, I can't uh, stay with you the whole session because our governor is coming to visit my department. And this is always important also economically, maybe to get uh, new funding and equipment. So I will demonstrate the power of microbes um, and hope to get a new new fundings for our buildings and, and personal. So with this, I'd like to thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer any question you should raise. Thank you very much, Professor Kubitz, uh, for the wonderful lecture. Um, I would like to uh, uh, refer to something you said in the beginning. Uh, on one of the slides, you mentioned that uh, Annually, Austria releases uh, around 40 tons of plastics uh, in the Danube. Uh, and you made, uh, uh, so to say, uh, a juxtaposition of microplastics against the uh, bigger uh, plastics. Uh, what, uh, what amount, what percentage uh, 
of, of those 40 tons is actually microplastics. Do you have a data on that? Yeah, unfortunately, um, what has been calculated is that microplastics are, are um, it's thousands of tons, yeah. So the, uh, what was found in the Danube, that's um, according to the definition, not yet, not yet microplastics. Yeah, it's, it's larger particles. So they looked at the size of a fish larvae. Um, but at, at that stage, um, from the Danube, um, they didn't check uh, really microplastic particles. Yeah. So um, that that stuff that was found in Danube that that was hypothesized really comes from from I don't know from bottles and other materials that entered the river, yeah, from, so from uh, littering of the environment. While uh, microplastics really come um, from from households and passing the wastewater treatment plant, depending on the wastewater treatment plant, a lot is not uh, retained and goes to the river. In terms of microplastics from washing, for example, but I also should add, so um, the wastewater treatment plant, if it retains microplastics, it's also not so nice because then it goes into the sludge and the sludge goes onto our fields. Yeah, so the problem is it's not really gone. If we don't have it in water, we have it in our fields. And one of my colleagues, uh, she's uh, doing uh, analysis on our fields around Vienna. And unfortunately, you can really see it in your cheap light microscope, you can see plastics from the soil. And that's really alarming to me. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, one more short question for me. Um, uh, have you managed to, uh, uh, to, to, to demonstrate and to simulate uh, uh, the enzymatic degradation on the large scale? which is, let's say, comparable to a waste treatment plant? Uh, or have you only uh, proven the concept in the lab, so to say? Um, our largest volume was um, a couple of hundred of liters, yeah? So it was more than just lab scale. It was reactors that we have constructed. But yeah, that's, that's the scale right now. It's not ton scale yet, but it looks quite good that it also could be scaled up, yeah? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, if there are uh, any other questions, uh, um, I suggest to, uh, to answer them uh, additionally, uh, because uh, you have to leave now. And uh, I wish you all the best uh, on your meeting. And thank you. Uh, in your work. And uh, it was a pleasure and an honor to have you here. Uh, thanks a lot and uh, I'll see you soon. Thank you for the invitation. And now we go to our next speaker, who is uh, Professor Topalova. Professor Topalova is uh, a professor at the uh, Sofia University uh, here in uh, the biological faculty based in Sofia. Uh, her interests are uh, primarily in uh, biological control management and microbiology, and she is also coordinator of uh, Center of uh, Competence, uh, which is uh, called uh, Clean Technologies for Sustainable Environment. And today she will uh, uh, talk about uh, innovative and applied potential wastewater treatment biotechnologies based to circular economy. Professor Tupalova, the floor is yours. We can hear you and also yeah. we are seeing the slides. Okay, thank you very much uh, for, uh, for organization uh, of these lectures. Uh, excuse me, first of all, I want to uh, share that I want to devote this lecture of uh, my teacher and founder of environmental biotechnology, Professor Raichu Dimpov. So, uh, you can see the subject of the lectures and my co authors. Uh, contemporary environmental biotechnology 
uh, force uh, very much the clever solution of the wastewater treatment uh, biotechnologies. Uh, but first of all, let's uh, see what uh, modules uh, uh, we can uh, see in one biotechnology. One wastewater treatment biotechnology consists of uh, four modules. First of them is equipment or bioreactors. Second is the biological systems. This is microbiological uh, society, biofilm, activated sludge, microbiological preparation. Uh, modulus is parameters of the technology, like uh, pH, uh, temperature, substrates, uh, dissolved oxygen, and etc. And the third uh, the fourth modulus is a uh, system of control and management. Uh, this is apparatus, strategy, bioindicator, standards, advanced scientific methods. Uh, most dynamic part of uh, biotechnology that uh, can use for many innovation to accelerate uh, the wastewater treatment biotechnology is the biological systems, parameters of the technology, and systems of control and management. Uh, all of these uh, three dynamic parts of biotechnology usually cause uh, uh, different solutions of the most critical problems of the environment. And one of them is uh, uh, development full intelligent use of potential of biological systems. Uh, second is arrangement of the most in wastewater treatment plants according to the logic of the biological processes. Uh, third is hybrid technology for completely finished technologies well integrated in the environment. In uh, other uh, topics, uh, you will see one of our uh, innovation in hybrid technology uh, with application of plasma technologies. Uh, another important solution is uh, develop the algorithms and solutions for low toxic environment by means of management of intoxication, detoxication processes. Uh, here you can locate uh, uh, the problem that uh, we just discussed with Professor Gobitz, uh, biodegradation of um, microplastics in wastewater treatment plants. Uh, another is creation and application innovative biotechnology for control and management. Here, the potential is very large with how automated people of circular economy with special accent for uh, resource and energy efficiency. Uh, in this lecture, we will put uh, the accent uh, on the five uh, focuses uh, of the technologies. First is controlled elimination of uh, carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus, integration and management of detoxication element in biotechnology, this is again connection with the previous lectures. Uh, development of the water treatment biotechnology from molecular analysis to full scale level. This is one very good uh, uh, aspect, uh, scaling up in biotechnology, but uh, with large, large scaling up. Uh, circular economy in the wastewater treatment biotechnology face uh, technology to resource and to uh, tra transforming of uh, every uh, waste in the valuable product and the fifth is innovation biocontrol and automation let's see one by one these uh, five uh, points control elimination of uh, carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus. Uh, this is the optimal scheme for elimination of the, these biogenic elements, but most important here is uh, arrangement of the modules according to the logic of biological metabolic processes uh, with uh, decrease uh, of pollution, uh, 
COG with these parameters and with increase of redox potential. In this scheme, uh, very important uh, again is two critical parameters. First is uh, 300 milligram per liter starting uh, concentration of acetate. And the second parameter is construction of very special microbial society with poly P bacteria, uh, consisted uh, again uh, mainly from uh, Pseudomonas and from Acinetobacter. In this scheme, uh, that is uh, Shigiover, uh, masterpiece uh, of functional biotechnology, is uh, very important to say that. Most difficult moment here is the management, management of microbial society. And uh, here you can see uh, all pictures are originals, our from our investigation in our laboratory. Uh, two parts of polypi bacteria. This is uh, bacteria from Genesis Cystinetobacter, uh, and this is bacteria from uh, Genus Pseudomonas. You saw that uh, this uh, gen genus is uh, very important, critical for biodegradation of microplastic. Uh, so, uh, excuse me, little. Uh, I want to say here two innovation we can uh, uh, see in this uh, very special arrangement of the modules, except uh, uh, training of clear water. Uh, one innovation here is excess of sludge that is rich with polyphosphate. And this sludge can be used uh, for extraction as phosphorus as very, as very valuable resource. And innovation two, again, I want to make connection with the first lecture. Here in aerobic bioreactor, polybacteria accumulated polyhydroxybutyrate and polyhydroxyacetate. This is highly biodegradable, very biocompatible uh, plastic that can be used uh, for the threads in cosmetics, in the surgery, in a very special other application. And this is one of the future developments for very, very grazy water to receive two very important resources including the clear water. This is Shigova. <laughs> Again, integration of manageable detoxication elements. Uh, one of the most critical problem in wastewater treatment biotechnologies is uh, contamination of the wastewater with different toxic pollutants. This is not only microplastic. This is uh, uh, products from uh, pharmaceutical industry. This uh, different disinfectants, you see this COVID uh, pandemia, uh, polluted water with a lot of disinfectants that are very hardly biodegradable, except that uh, they disturb uh, very much the wastewater technology, except that uh, one of the uh, most important uh, critical xenobiotic, this is PFAS, that is in the center of European law now and uh, in the center of horizontal uh, vice advice and horizontal uh, horizon Europe, uh, uh, horizon Europe, uh, that uh, uh, put in the center uh, receiving the uh, low toxic environment. So what is our solution? What is our uh, management of the real process in the real wastewater treatment technology? Here you can see the scheme of one uh, classical technology with biological treatment. And with red arrows, you can see that in uh, every stage of this way, wastewater treatment, we can find all these xenobiotics and uh, we have to uh, 
make some uh, solutions for elimination of these xenobiotics in primary sedimentation, in biological treatment, in secondary sedimentation, uh, in the clear water, we find this solution. Uh, here I want to say uh, to show an example what happens with uh, small animals in wastewater treatment plants after action of these toxic pollutants. This is a pistilis for several seconds, the animal dies. This is very, this is opercularia. Again, very important indicator. After action of this xenobiotics, he's suffering very much and dies. Another thing, uh, what is uh, very important to create the technology and to input this detoxication element in the real technology. Very important is concentration of xenobiotics, independence of chemical structure, and another important factor is the way of entering of these xenobiotics in wastewater treatment technologies. So, uh, question that uh, Mr. Nikolov uh, asked, uh, we make uh, a lot of models in lab scale, laboratory like lab scale, in specially prepared uh, with automation uh, uh, wastewater treatment plant located in our laboratory. Uh, and uh, with uh, this uh, lab scale, we simulated processes with different concentration of different toxic pollutants and real wastewater. And in this simulation, our purpose was to create algorithm for adaptation and for internal bio-augmentation of activated sludge. And this algorithm to use for the commercial product that we will sell to other wastewater treatment plants. This is intellectual product. Here you can see the situation of simulation of increasing the concentration. Here you can see what happened with microorganisms. But, uh, we discovered that uh, when the activated sludge was uh, highly specialized in biodegradation of uh, xenobiotics, uh, Xenobiotic degrading microorganism disappeared. This was very strange uh, thing. After that, with another experiment, with another model, uh, uh, we discovered that uh, uh, adaptation of activated sludge uh, passed through different uh, phases. This is a uh, recent in situ hybridization analysis that explain. What happened with microorganisms? With blue color, we can see all microorganisms. With red color, this is microorganisms from genus Pseudomonas that are highly, highly active to biodegradation. Early phase of adaptation. Middle phase of adaptation, we receive a lot of microorganisms from uh, genus Pseudomonas, but these microorganisms were, were dispersed, they were homogenic in the media. See what happened in the most active phase. Uh, microorganisms from genus Pseudomonas formed clusters, synergetic structure. That synerge synergetic structures consist of from uh, not uh, culturable microorganisms with very, very active uh, in uh, biodegradation of xenobiotics. So this is algorithm we described like uh, graphical and like mathematical algorithm. And after that recommended this algorithm of uh, uh, plants for dye industry, for uh, pharmaceutical industry. So biotechnology already sell not microorganisms. We sell the rules for obtaining and for bio-augmentation of microorganisms. Development of auto treatment technology from molecules full uh, scale. Uh, this is uh, the enlarging the scale of biotechnology. From the risk events, 
see how looks the waters from the dyeing industry. Same thing after that modeling in laboratory, after that construction of algorithm on the base of molecular analysis, and after that with intellectual uh, proposal, we uh, come back this algorithm, the real wastewater treatment plants. This allow biotechnology uh, with uh, good investigation and control to pass directly to the ERL 8 and 9 and directly to those real rules for uh, including the uh, intoxication element in the real biobacin in wastewater treatment plant. Uh, resource and energy efficiency of wastewater technology. Sorry. Another example. Uh, this is again classical scheme of wastewater treatment plants, uh, similar like uh, treatment plants of Kubratovo, of Sofia town, but uh, like solid product, we receive the primary and secondary uh, sludge. This sludge uh, uh, goes to the methane tanks uh, and producing uh, biogas. And after that, producing the biogas, this is one of the product from the waste we receive again energy, but uh, again, uh, receive the compost uh, that we can use for biofertilizer with uh, adding uh, the microorganisms that uh, stimulated biodegradation of xenobiotics that remain after biogas production. I want to say another innovation here. Uh, biogas production uh, can be direct in the special aspect and uh, instead the methane, we can uh, receive the hydrogen. And this is the future of biogas uh, uh, production, uh, future of receiving uh, the fuels with, uh, 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 without uh, the carbon dioxide emission. This is the same scheme. Uh, this is the methane tanks of uh, wastewater treatment plants. This is our analysis, molecular analysis, but what happened after this molecular analysis of the process of biogas production? Happened something very important. This is methanogenic consortium, and on the base uh, of analysis, essence analysis, we creation online in real time a uh, system for management of the most difficult manageable system of biogas production. The critical problem now in this uh, uh, biogas production processes is uh, that the control usually is external. With external parameters, we develop the system uh, for the internal control that increase uh, with 40% uh, uh, the biogas production on the base of good, uh, very, very good uh, uh, manage, management of the process. This is again our paper, but this is biogas production uh, station in uh, Sofia waste uh, treatment plants uh, where uh, biogas is uh, uh, produced on the base of food, uh, waste food. And uh, the last innovation, I want to say the whole vision, whole strategy for biotechnological and for a circular economy a solution of one villages. Uh, West is uh, from food, from plant, from different other uh, agricultural activity uh, can collect, can transform and treat it with special ultrasonic Treatment to unify this substrate. This is first innovation. Second innovation is ultrasonic treatment. After that, uh, they using this uh, solid waste for producing of biogas. But where is connection with wastewater treatment plants? Here in the small towns, we have small wastewater treatment plants. They produce small 
amount of primary and secondary sludge. This sludge again, uh, we collected in this uh, biogas production plants. And in the end, with innovation uh, three, uh, on the base of solid waste and on the base of uh, activated sludge, we supply with energy small village as a whole. In the end, from the compost, we receive again biofertilizer. See, whole strategy, many, many biotechnological solutions, uh, proposed solution of circular economy with a resource and energy uh, saving and effectiveness. Conclusion. The development of environmental biotechnology is fruitful base for conversion of wastewater and wastes in resources and energy working for circular economy. This is the European strategy for circular economy, bioeconomic economy, and green deal. All this ensure application of intelligent solutions of the most critical problems of our life and sustainable protection of environment of the our planet. This is our future building that uh, we already started to build. Uh, uh, the uh, amount of the project, uh, this is the project sponsored by, by operational program, Science and Education for Smart Growth, is 23 million level. Uh, in this uh, uh, living lab, uh, this building will work with uh, like a living lab uh, with uh, many ecological feature. Uh, we will create uh, most of this and other environmental technology phase to circular economy. This is our small team. Uh, I want to present uh, Associate Professor Irina Schneider, Associate Professor Ivana Todorova, Dr. Mikhaila Belukova, uh, Dr. Uh, Ivail Yotinov, and Dr. Nora Dinova. All of them uh, was PhD previous students in our team. And uh, with uh, them, we created all this technology that I told in this moment. Thank you very much. This is our contact. I very open for future uh, technology for uh, joint work uh, with uh, different teams. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Tupalova. Uh, uh, do you hear me because I'm using headphones because I uh, received feedback that my sound is not very good now. Can you hear me well? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Are you available to take the questions at the end of the session or uh, will you be here until the end? Can you ask you to ask me a question now because I am in the time of another conference okay. the moment. that will be fine that's fine uh, uh first a big thank you for for sharing your uh, your experience and the different uh, innovations you covered in your slides uh, you mentioned something right at the very beginning uh, that uh, the greatest difficulty in the uh, biological wastewater treatment is uh, actually uh, managing of the uh, microbial society. Uh, what is so difficult about it? Uh, uh, the monitoring of how the microbial society develops and when to act or uh, what aspect uh, do you think is uh, uh, really creating this difficulty? Thank you for the question. In the real wastewater treatment plants, the biological system is one biocenosis with different trophic levels. So in this complex biocenosis, first level is bacteria. The second level is uh, animals uh, with one cell. Uh, and the third level is uh, these animals that I show. And the relation between these organisms really is not uh, very uh, easy process to manage. The process uh, 
have to manage from one side from the external parameters and from the second side from the pressure from these animals. These animals are more sensitive to the different pollutants. So we have to find this concentration, maximum concentration, this is kinetics of the process, uh, that uh, allow bacteria to work with high velocity, but this concentration, concentration have to not be toxic for the animals because they have, have very important functions in the process. This is one of the difficulties. The second difficulty is these toxic pollutants in the wastewater treatment. Uh, usually, uh, in the entrance, these pollutants are with different concentration, in different combination, and this is not constant process. And this is the, uh, we are working with Sufis Kavuda now to create uh, the technology for uh, reaching this balance of uh, entrance and concentration of toxic pollutants. This is two factors. Thank you very much for the nice explanation. It really uh, uh, answered the question right to the point. Uh, so I have a few other questions, but uh, I suggest because we are moving a little bit uh, behind schedule uh, uh, to, to ask them uh, offline additionally, and also to send the answers to the participants. And with that, I would like to thank you for the participation and for the wonderful lecture. Uh, you are free to enter your uh, uh, other appointment and a uh, big thank you once again. And uh, we are moving to, to our next speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you. So our next speaker is uh, Dubril Valchev, uh, who is an engineer in the field of uh, water supply and sewage. Uh, he is uh, representing the uh, University of uh, Architecture, Civil Engineering and uh, Geodesy uh, uh, within the uh, Clear Technologies for Sustainable Environment project. And uh, he's here to share with us uh, 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 an experiment uh, uh, which involves uh, microalgal biotechnology. Uh, welcome, Mr. Valchev. Uh, the floor is yours. We see the presentation. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, quite well. Thank you. Ah, okay. Thank you. Uh, hello from me. Uh, thank you, uh, first of all, uh, to the organizers of this uh, event. It's a wonderful event. And thank you for the invitation. Uh, today, I'm going to present to you uh, part of our research in our laboratory at the University of Architecture, Civil Engineering and Geodesy. That is also a part of the project that uh, Professor Tupalova uh, introduced in her uh, presentation, Clean Technologies for Sustainable Environment, Waters, Waste, Energy and Circular Economy. I'm the presenter today, but uh, the research is actually a teamwork and uh, our team is consisted of the head of our department of water supply, sewage, sewage uh, water and wastewater treatment, uh, Professor Rina Ribarova, uh, myself, and also uh, Professor Maya Stoyneva Gertner, uh, and uh, Associate Professor Bogoyo Zunu from the Department of Botan Botany at the Sofia University, uh, St. Clement Okritsky. Uh, also, the, resu the results are uh, published in an article from this year. And if you're interested in more detail in the research, you can also go, go ahead and uh, check it out after the presentation. Uh, so, the presentation plan is, uh, first I'm going to show you some of the um, relevant problems connected to the phosphorus uh, removal and phosphorus management, and then uh, some of the basics with the algae-based uh, technologies, wastewater treatment technologies, uh, the whole experiment that we managed to conduct, the results from it, and some of the conclusions that we managed to get. Uh, 
so as we all know, phosphorus is a very important biogenic element that is a part of all biological process, uh, that is part of all biological organisms in the world. And unfortunately, it is an exhaustible resource, so it has no natural cycle. Uh, it is used in different kinds of uh, industries. It's widespread, it's used in agriculture, metallurgy, detergents, and so on and so on. And some of it ends up into uh, the sewage system and from there into the wastewater, into the wastewater treatment plant. And uh, from there, it usually gets incorporated into the sludge from the wastewater treatment plant. And again, then most of it gets uh, disposed into large landfills. So uh, since it has no natural cycle, well, some of the uh, main policies of the uh, of some of the main European policies have embedded its recovery in their uh, in their documents, such as uh, the policies for circular economy, the Green Deal, and so on. The conventional the conventional wastewater treatment uh, technologies for phosphorus removal uh, mainly include uh, the dosing of coagulants directly into the biological uh, treatment process of the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, this happens with uh, usually ferric chloride, aluminum sulfate, uh, that is put into the either uh, activated sludge reactor or into the secondary clarifier, which results in a mixture of chemical and biological sludge that makes the um, recovery of phosphorus much more difficult. Uh, also, the recovery of the sludge as a whole is also very difficult with these processes. There is also a, a biological process of uh, phosphorus removal, as uh, Professor Topal uh, also mentioned, but it's very difficult to be managed in the wastewater treatment plants, and usually uh, in some seasons they also go to this uh, um, chemical removal of the phosphorus. So, the uh, suggested uh, technological scheme of uh, the algae removal of uh, this biogenic element includes a polishing step, a tertiary treatment uh, with uh, the algae, uh, which results in no chemicals, no chemical addition to the uh, water, and uh, a generation of entire bio biological sludge with a higher quality of the treated uh, wastewater effluent. So the treated effluent has lower nitrogen levels, higher uh, dissolved oxygen levels, lower pathogens. Uh, also, mm, the biological sludge can be then recovered as a, uh, for can be used for the production of biofuels. Can be used also in agriculture if it's uh, clean enough and if the policy uh, allows it, of course. And then. Uh, the current development of this algae-based um, wastewater treatment technology is at the laboratory and pilot scale, and it's uh, uh, one of the um, main technologies in the um, st strategic documents of the uh, European Commission from 2020. Uh, so, the main wastewater treatment uh, technologies with algae include uh, suspended, immobilized, and attached growth systems. These are the three main groups of reactors for algae-based wastewater treatment, uh, which can be opened or enclosed systems. For wastewater treatment, the most used technology is this that you can see on the uh, screen. It's called uh, high-rate algal ponds or raceway ponds, where uh, the wastewater is uh, mixed with the algae um, suspension. Uh, it stays for the certain amount of uh, time, for the certain uh, hydraulic retention time, and then it gets to a uh, installation for the removal of the algae from the water, and then the water is uh, disposed or treated even more if, it wants to, if uh, the operator wants to reuse it. Uh, in our uh, research, uh, we uh, since there is no, since there is no algal strain that is uh, decided as an optimal strain. There are some problems with the development of the stains. Uh, we decided to try something new with this algae-based wastewater treatment technology. So uh, we, are, uh, we are using uh, an algal strain that is from the green evolutionary line that is actually a multicellular uh, strain instead of a unicellular strain that is usually used in these technologies. 
This is uh, it, that is called capsulin unitins. It's uh, isolated from the natural uh, park of uh, Rila here in Bulgaria, so it's natural for uh, the Bulgarian environment, and it's cultivated as a monoculture in the Sofia University Saint Clement Ochritsky Biological Labs. So the reasons for this selection of this strain. Uh, first and main, uh, the first and main reason is that it's local for Bulgaria, so it's already adapted to the specifics of this climate zone. Uh, it's, as I mentioned, filamentous multicellular algal species, which, ma which makes it more resistant to predation and uh, to contamination. It's from the green evolutionary line that is uh, most preferred for phosphorus removal. It has the, the highest phosphorus removal rates in the literature. And also the preliminary experiments that we uh, conducted with this strain uh, showed a very good fast adaptation to the uh, specifics of the wastewater that we used here in Bulgaria. Uh, the reactor, sorry, uh, the reactor that we used is a laboratory scale reactor, uh, also known as uh, PSBR or photosequencing batch reactor uh, with suspended growth of this algae. It's uh, a transparent cylinder, as you can see on the uh, picture here. It's uh, mm, supplied with uh, an electric, electric stirrer, so the approximate tangential flow velocity is uh, approximately 0 0.3 meters per second. It's, uh, uh, it, it also has uh, uh, a control panel that measures the dissolved oxygen, pH levels, and temperature in the reactor uh, every hour, and we place it near a north, northern window, so uh, the algae can um, actually be exposed to the, their natural photo period. So we have no additional uh, illumination of uh, artificial sources. The wastewater that we used is uh, from the wastewater treatment plant of Sofia, located in Kubrato village. Uh, with capacity of 1.3 uh, million people equivalent. The phosphorus removal in this wastewater treatment plant is uh, chemical, although there is a biological um, phosphorus removal embedded into the technology, but the main phosphorus removal is through uh, chemical addition of uh, ferric chloride. And uh, the wastewater was taken at uh, the effluent channel of the uh, wastewater treatment plant and to increase the uh, phosphorus uh, into the water to simulate different concentrations we used uh, uh, potassium uh, uh, potassium uh, dehydrogen phosphate so uh, the working mode of the reactor the uh, clear the clean cultivated algal strain was added to the reactor a uh, uh, first portion of the water is added again uh, uh, into also into the reactor. Then the, the electric stirrer is started. An immediate sample was taken as a starting reference point, and then uh, samples were taken through certain periods of time to establish the needed correlation. After the uh, final concentration is reached, uh, has reached the the needed, for example, in the regulation, the <coughs> The stirrer was stopped, algae was settled, the decant was removed, and then another portion of wastewater was added to the reactor, and then stirrer, the stirrer was started again. And uh, um, again, the, uh, a starting sample was taken, and then uh, the second side cycle started over. So this is a sequencing batch reactor. It, it works in batches. Uh, four cycles were conducted uh, in uh, total. So uh, the analysis uh, were for total phosphorus and total nitrogen, the chemical analysis, well, with uh, standard uh, spectrophotometric uh, analysis. Uh, also, light microscopic uh, analysis were made in order to follow the development of the culture into the reactor. And the data process was uh, through Microsoft Excel. The, these are some of the uh, results from the phosphorus for the phosphorus uh, removal rates. Uh, as you can see, this is a correlation between the hydraulic retention time in hours and the total phosphorus uh, on the y-axis. The trend lines in each of the sections uh, demonstrate the 
uh, phosphorus removal rates, the slope of the trend lines. And uh, what our research showed from these four cycles is that uh, the absolute phosphorus removal rates were between 0 0.4 and, and 1 milligrams per liter, which is uh, in the mid to high range uh, compared to the literature, because in the literature it's uh, around 0 0.3 to 2 milligrams per liter, but uh, mostly lower than 0 0.75. And the PRRs inside each cycle, which means that each of these sections of the cycles are actually a bit higher. And this is probably due to the luxury uptake, because the phosphorus concentrations here in the beginning of the cycles are much higher than here. Luxury uptake meaning means that the algae uptake more phosphorus uh, to store into the cells for times when there is no in, there is not enough phosphorus in the cells. Uh, so this with these um, PRRs that we managed to uh, get phosphorus removal rates, the average needed hydraulic retention time was of between three and fifteen days to reach a final concentration that is actually lower than the regulation in Bulgaria. But uh, as we uh, did our uh, research, we uh, went, uh, we uh, saw another correlation that is also uh, part of the things that are uh, presented in the uh, scientific literature. It is a correlation between the uh, hydraulic retention time, the pH of the media and the uh, total phosphorus concentration. With the increase of the pH levels, there is a decrease in the phosphorus concentration, as you can see. So the whole cycle was from 0.1 to 0.3. So this is the, the representation of the full biological treatment of the process. This fast drop here, where uh, the uh, peak of the pH uh, matches the low, the lowest point of the phosphorus is actually uh, due to a phenomenon called uh, biological, uh, called uh, biologically mediated chemical phosphorus removal. So the increased pH uh, forces the uh, calcium and magnesium cations to bond to the uh, hydroxyl uh, anions and form flocks that can be easily then settled after the uh, stoppage of the stir. So if such uh, if such an um, working mode can be established as a stable process, uh, the hydraulic retention time can be actually lowered from uh, four days for this cycle to only one day for this cycle. And uh, the whole process is going to, the whole working mode is going to be consisted of filling, mixing, settling, decanting at, uh, uh, as the, and each of these processes have to be um, um, directly correlated to the pH levels. So the uh, settling process needs to happen at peak illumination, at peak photo photosynthesis. So the pH levels can be highest and the uh, phosphorus levels can, levels can be lower. Uh, so this means that there is a chemical phosphorus removal and biological phosphorus removal at the same time without any addition of uh, uh, heavy metals such as uh, ferric chloride or aluminum sulfate. Uh, these settling properties, as I mentioned before, uh, happened with our experiment with medium nitens at pH levels at around 8.5 to 9.5, which is again into the uh, into the spectrum of the regulation it happened after 30 minutes of uh, settling and uh, of course this is managed at the laboratory scale and uh, further further research is uh, needed to confirm the, these laboratory results if these can be managed in actual uh, pilot and uh, large scale full scale uh, wastewater treatment plants another uh, good quality of this uh, capsule medium stain is actually that it didn't uh, get contaminated in, uh, in it, it remained dominant into the reactor there was uh, some very little contaminations on the bottom of the reactor that uh, didn't actually 
didn't actually manage to change any PRRs or uh, pH. The pH levels in DO and the dissolved oxygen levels remained uh, constant in their uh, dynamics throughout the whole experiment. Of course, further research is also needed to confirm these results. Uh, and in conclusion, these results indicate that this technology uh, has a potential to overcome some of the major drawbacks of the wastewater treatment with algae, uh, which are the huge, mainly the huge area require, requirements and the uh, expensive and unreliable harvesting of the wastewater. Also, there is no optimal strain for uh, wastewater, and we are also uh, aiming at uh, confirming this at a larger scale. Also, uh, to set more technological parameters than just the PRRs and the uh, pH and the dissolved oxygen, uh, we need to uh, establish all of them, all of the technological parameters. And of course, this study is just an encouraging first step for future research and uh, the long term applicability of this. A specific algal strain. Uh, I would also uh, like to thank again the same uh, project that I mentioned before, Clean Technologies for Sustainable Environment, Waters, Waste, Energy for Circular Economy for financing the labor of this uh, experiment and also the project D10518 that was funded by our Center for Research and Design at our university for the costs of uh, materials. And I would also like to thank everyone in this panel for your attention. And I'm here for questions if you have any. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Volchev. Uh, actually, I have a few questions, but today, uh, uh, but now I will give the floor to Professor Metka for his interview because uh, he has a fixed time window and we have to adhere okay. to it. Uh, will you be here uh, in half an hour after the interview to finish the discussion? Uh, yes, I can be here. Okay. okay, good. Thank you very much. With this, I give the floor to uh, Professor Metka, and uh, after the interview finishes, uh, we will continue with uh, one or two questions to uh, Mr. Volchev, and uh, I will take a very short time to finish the topic on wastewater uh with uh, a few uh, points about uh, wastewater surveillance and epidemiology thank you i give the floor to professor metka uh thank you valentin uh, actually this is uh rather an interview and not a speech so professor metka can you hear me yes hello hello here marcus metka yes i uh, greet you everybody Thank you very much for accepting this invitation to make an interview with you. As you know, this interview will, will be a friendly one and not a grilling one. So to introduce you to the society, we are friends for, I think, more than 40 years already. And uh, we have, in a way, the same destiny. You abandoned obstetrics and gynecology in order to go more in direction of um, food, healthy food, healthy lifestyle. Why did you go this way? Why did you make this step? Well, obstetrics and gynecology is a fantastic job. What made you more interested in food and healthy lifestyle? Yes, uh, Timmy, um, it's a good question. Um, I started, of course, traditionally uh, with uh, gyne in gynecology, uh, also with endocrinology, yes, as the the gynecological endocrinology. And uh, in the gynecolog gynecological endocrinology, I worked a lot with menopause, with the climacteric, yes, also with the hormonal situation of the woman. And I have seen that uh, with hormones, you can make a lot of things, good things uh, in anti aging, let's say, yes. But uh, with the years, I have seen that more important than hormones, yes, like estrogen or like growth hormone and so on, yes, are uh, lifestyle uh, sites like nutrition. Nutrition and nutrition is also water, of course, yes. And so we are in our, in our tema of uh, today, yes. Uh, when I... Uh, started at the university clinic it was very interesting. 
there was a very big department for uh, physical therapy in gynecology. It was mainly hydrotherapy, hydrotherapy and pineology. Why? Because before the Second World War, uh, you didn't have antibiotics, you didn't have uh, uh, synthetic uh, analgetics, yes? Though you had to work with water mainly, yes? And I was very impressed and worked a lot uh, uh, in this time with hydrotherapy and pineology in uh, gynecology. But nevertheless, uh, this department, this very big department, was reduced more and more, yes? Because, uh, of course, in our time, in our time with our antibiotics, with our big pharma, let's say, yes, the water therapy has not the same interest like hundreds of years before, yes? So that's a good answer and also opens the door for the next question. Uh, when we were speaking about this event, uh, we have shared ideas why uh, uh, we have chosen Vienna exactly for making the uh, our water event. Uh, what is uh, so important uh, in Vienna related to water? Different things. Uh, water is the basic of a civilization of a of a urbanic civilization yes uh, we know that the first uh, uh, settlements 4000 5000 years ago yes the most important was a clear and clean water yes otherwise it was not possible uh, to build a civilization and uh, thousands year later yes it was also the same. Uh, the clean water uh, was the most important in preventive medicine. And Vienna, before the First World War, you know, in the turn of the century, it was, you can see, say, a hot spot, yes, in medicine, but also in preventive medicine. And it's interesting that the poli politics, yes, in this time, they uh, constructed a very, very uh, um, progressive uh, system of water supply in Vienna, Hochquellwasserleitung, it's called, yes. And uh, we were pioneers uh, in Europe in this time. It was about 1850, 1860, yes. That's the one side. The other side is the medical side. Uh, Vienna in the turn of the century was also a hot spot in medicine worldwide, yes? And uh, we had, uh, I bring you an example, a very living example. If you go in the public park, Stadtpark of Vienna, you know there is, for example, a, a monument for Johann Strauss, for Brahms, but also for the big medical professors, yes? But the the most huge monument, yes, in this public park is for Pfarrer Kneipp. He was a hydrotherapist, yes, you know, the Kneipp therapy, yes, uh, is basic on the healing effects of water, yes. And he was the most important uh, personality in this time. And an another, we have another big monument in Türkenschanz Park. Uh, this was uh, Vincent Prisnitz. Prisnitz was before Kneipp. He was, uh, when, if you want, uh, like the founder of the hydrotherapy, of the therapy uh, with the water. This therapy with water was extremely important in this time. You didn't have other things, yes? Uh, it was the main therapy, yes? And therefore, in this Habsburg monarchy, yeah? There were spots like Karlsbad, Marienbad, yes? They cured with water, cured with water externally and internally, yes? And all from Europe, all the kings, King of England was uh, in Marienbad and in Karlsbad, for example. Atatürk was in Karlsbad, yes? In the third of the century. Uh, uh, all big personalities came there for the healing properties of uh, the water. Goethe 
Goethe, he, he was three, four, five times a year, he was in Marienbad, yes? And he fell in love, you know, this is a Marienbad Elegin. He fell in love in the age of 80 uh, to a girl of 18, yes? Because it was the water, I think, yes? <laughs> As you see, it has a, a very healing effect, yes? The water. Of course, the so historians go back till the Romans, we know, of course, yes. I do appreciate that you didn't mention Lenin as well, uh, visiting uh, your bats and Stalin, uh, because they were probably also attending. But uh, if we transpone this um, history to the modern times, what is the role of water today in terms of therapy and how you can use or how one can use uh, water as a therapy, water as a medicine? Yes, as a, um, it is uh, believed that at least that the thermal properties of water assist the healing. Uh, the, the body's reaction to hot and cold water causes the nerves at the surface of the skin to carry impulses deep into the body. This reaction is thought to lessen pain sensitivity, stimulates the immune system, that's very important, yes, aid lymphatic drainage, yes, and increase the blood circulation. That's of course very so. So you can make a hardening, yes, an upheaval, and hardening uh, at least of the body. Yes, uh, these are the the basics. Of course, it is. It, this is all empiric, empiric, and there are not so many studies. Yes, uh, 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 scientific basic studies. We have one from France, 1994, I think, uh, uh, that uh, water as a water therapy for back pain, and one of uh, the United States that was uh, ten years later, I think. But there, there are making a lot of studies still uh, because you have to know that. Uh, for big pharma, you can hear me still, yes? Excellent. Good? Yes. Excellent, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Fine. Uh, uh, that for big pharma, the water therapy is not so interesting, and so there is not so much money uh, for uh, scientific, uh, for scientific uh, research uh, to the healing properties of water, but I am sure that this will have a revival, I'm very sure, yes? And also when we go here back to, to Vienna, to Austria, uh, our VAMED, VAMED, you know, it's a big company or the medical company, and uh, they make a lot of spas, yes? Spa, you know, spa is, is a translation of uh, salu uh, per aqua, also salute, uh, health per water, yes? That's the Romans, you know, the, the Romans, when they, when they constructed a new town, yes, they didn't look for geopolitical uh, situation or something. They looked, where was the best water, yes? Where was the healing water? And there they built the big towns, yes? And uh, they, they uh, from, the, from the Romans, we have this spa expression, the salu, the health, uh, for uh, by water, health by water. I think there's a, a big future, a very big future for this form. And people uh, want more and more this, uh, let's say, complementive, uh, complementary uh, medical um, um, uh, therapies. That's correct. Actually, you are right that water cannot be patented. And this is why there are not so many, many investments uh, in water therapies, but uh, still people uh, believe and trust in water therapy and also in water as a daily uh, way to treat something. Uh, in fact, um, the, the one of the ladies who opened the event pledged a lot of money for research in terms of water in Europe, which gives me more confidence that this uh, 
uh, let's say, uh, negligence of water as a therapy or negligence of water as an important part of, of our life and of our healthy life uh, will be overcome because there are a lot of paradoxes. You know, in Vienna, uh, you have excellent water and excellent quality of water and 1,000 kilometers far away in a city I don't want to mention where, for example, you ca hardly get potable water, and this is within the EU. So uh, these uh, differences need to be overcome, and uh, this is also part of the mission of this event, to, to open the door for more research and for more partnership. And when we speak about water as a medicine, uh, you know that we say, dosis facit venenum. Could the, water, could the water be also a poison, in a way? I don't, you have always to differentiate uh, water uh, internal, as so you to drink. Yes, of course uh, you can you can kill yourself with water. That's very well known. Yes, yes. Also, it's a question of the dosage, of course. Yes, but uh, to have not enough water is very dangerous. We know it. As the, the golden middle way, yes, it's a, it's about we say two two and a half liter of of a good uh, clear clean uh, water. That's uh, the best for internal use. Then of course you can have thermal waters. You know that's a long story with different minerals with different substances and so on. Yes, the other things. You have seen that I'm very, uh, very uh, enthusiastic for is um, the external use of water. Yes, uh, that was uh, the hydrotherapy is mostly as a traditionally an external use of water. Yes, where we have this hardening, yes, uh, hardening of the body. For example, Kneip. Kneip is, I think, well known, not only in, in, in Austria and in German, Germany. Uh, Kneip uh, had tuberculosis, yes, and he could heal the tuberculosis by swimming every day in the cold Danube, yes, yes. That was the starting for his uh, cold water therapy, the Kneip. Core, yes, the Kneipp therapy. Yes, and, um, but this is very different. Again, it's different uh, to have here scientific uh, uh, basic uh, uh, science. Uh, most of these things are empiric, yes, but nevertheless, it's very important for the future. I think very important. I think uh, that uh, while the there are a lot of empiric evidence for treatments with water. There are a lot of really evidence-based data that uh, the water needs to be decontaminated. And we had several excellent lectures before you, some from Austria, some from Bulgaria, I may say, who have been pointing at the contamination of the water, not only with microbes and with other, but also with microplastics. And the Danube is a good, uh, a good example of uh, how uh, big and mighty river can be contaminated with microplastics, which is a disaster. And I hope that all countries who are close to the Danube will see this as uh, a challenge and change the practices with using plastics and also contaminating with microplastics. Now, now we are coming to my last question for you. If you would uh, invest uh 1000 euro today in a share related to water what kind of share would be this uh, uh, for medical or for outside treatment for spa treatment where do you think will be the bigger development i i think in spa in spa that's that's uh, 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 um, uh, 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 a therapy, a medical therapy of the future, I'm sure, because it has no side effects. Yes, people, people are more and more skeptical to the pharmacies. It is so, yes, it is good or bad or not, it's another question, yes. And though they come more and more to therapies like water therapy, like hydrotherapy, biology, because there are really no side effects. Yes, there are probably only 
only two side effects. The one is that uh, spice making you lazy. Uh, and the second side effect that, that some spa treatments are really expensive and not affordable for everyone. But let's hope that in the close future, this will change because uh, once again, the living standard in Austria cannot be compared with the living standard in other countries in Europe where uh, spa is more a luxus than a daily. But excuse me, uh, Timmy, I must uh, contradict. contradict. Uh, for example, Kneip. Kneip is the cheapest therapy you can have. Yes, that's you true. Only, that's you, true. Only, you only go in, into a cold river. Yes, that's yes, true. you have to that's pay true. enough. Yes, that's yes. true. But Kneip should be that's that's a good point. But Kneip should be uh, uh, learned in the school because you know that in the Stadtpark, his statue is not close to uh, the statue of a violin player, but behind close to the yes. toilet. Uh, he is neglected in a way, and I agree with you that we, if I haven't learned about Kneip while I was studying medicine, Kneip was not popular at all. And you know that when I had my injury, I went with you uh, on a Kneip path, and it uh, did me very well, much better than the luxurious spa in the Switzerland. But still, yeah. this needs to be uh, more and more proclamated around Europe that there are even yes. cheaper alternatives to expensive and luxurious spa. Yeah, Professor Metka, sorry. thank you very much for your sharing your thoughts. And now it's Thanks. my pleasure to give back the word to Valentin. Have a nice day and enjoy the week. Bye-bye. Thank you, Dimitar, and thank you to Professor Metka for the wonderful interview. Um, actually, uh, what Professor Medke mentioned about uh, uh, one century ago, where uh, when we didn't have uh, uh, many antibiotics uh, and uh, uh, we had to resort to, uh, let's say, more traditional uh, types of medicine, I really hope uh, that we don't get in the same situation uh, again uh, because. Uh, uh, we all know that the horizon uh, for antimicrobial resistance is uh, uh, not that good uh, at the moment. And uh, this is something that I will mention shortly uh, when I talk about the information that we can get uh, in wastewater. Uh, but first, uh, I want uh, to, uh, to connect once again to Mr. Volchev, if he is here. Mr. Volchev, are you here? Yes. Okay. I so, uh, uh, I, I want to uh, to say one thing uh, before I ask you a question. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 direct, the direction of your research is uh, very, uh, very interesting in, and very important uh, because when you were starting uh, to uh, 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 to present your slides, uh, uh, I remember that actually phosphorus is uh, very important in our organisms, including uh, because it is an integral part of our uh, uh, DNA, RNA, and the nucleotides that make it. And also ATP, which is the main powerhouse of the uh, animal cell, is uh, uh, also has uh, three phosphate residues. So uh, really, the uh, phosphor as an element which does not have a natural uh, life cycle uh, gives us a lot to think about uh, harvesting it from from the leached out uh, water, so to say. Uh, I wanted to ask: uh, uh, Do you have data whether the um, clepsur medium uh, uh, you isolated from the Rio Mountain? Uh, uh, behaves differently from uh, other Clepsum medium uh, species, and uh, actually, uh, are uh, other research groups focused on uh, uh, phosphorus uh, um, extraction also working with uh, Clepsum medium, or uh, are typically other types of algae used? Okay, thank you for your question. Uh, so, uh, the, the thing that we 
your first question about the, if there is a difference between the chips or medium use in our wastewater compared to the natural. Uh, in our reactor, uh, maybe expectedly, uh, it happens some kind of a controlled eutrophication. So uh, basically, uh, the filaments uh, of the uh, chips or medium actually become shorter and they reproduce very fast because the environment is very rich in uh, the biogenous elements, nitrogen and phosphorus. And uh, also, um, the thing that happens in our reactor, since the biomass is very concentrated, uh, you can see these variations in pH levels. This is because of the very intense photosynthesis and the very concentrated algal biomass. So it's quite different from the natural, but uh, it, it, it adapts very fast to this uh, specifics of the wastewater. Uh, also, there were uh, other studies, one or two studies with uh, clipsor medium uh, from the clipsor medium uh, genus, not this specific strain, but they used attached growth systems. They uh, didn't use suspended growth systems, uh, which mm, makes it uh, less intense and uh, attached algal growth systems are very uh very difficult to manage because it's very difficult to get light into all parts of the reactor without uh putting uh energy into artificial illumination of the reactor and uh yes this is what i know for uh capsule medium for now uh in uh, and phosphorus removal uh for phosphorus as i mentioned uh, the green evolutionary line is mostly preferred. So, uh, genus like, genus like uh, Senedesmus and Chlorella are the most used globally, uh, no matter if, uh, uh, if, if you exclude the part with the specific environmental conditions. Uh, this uh, type of strain selection connected to the specific environmental uh, conditions that it's going to be applied to is called FICO prospecting and uh, a lot of authors do it. But Chlorella and then Senedesmus are the most used genus, but they are very difficult to remove from, to remove from uh, wastewater uh, because their uh, cells have, uh, are very small and they uh, stay like uh, uh, colloidal particles inside the water. They cannot settle, it's easy. And uh, the removal of the algae is very uh, energy intensive and it's very expensive. Thank you very much. And uh, one last thing that refers a little bit to uh, some of the previous uh, talks uh, of uh, Professor Tupalova and also of uh, Sabine from the previous session. Uh, uh, have you looked into the uh, the topic of whether there are any uh, algal toxins uh, with potential toxicity to the natural water fauna? Uh, yes, uh, we have seen uh, such strains, but uh, this was the first thing that we wanted to do in our research. Uh, we searched for an algal strain that doesn't release any toxins, but uh, in an open pond system, such as these that are mostly used, as you can probably imagine, uh, an open system into the environment can easily get contaminated from the air, from the natural surroundings, and from, of course, from the natural growing algae into the biological treatment that are remaining, for example, in the secondary clarifier. So the problem with these open systems is this uh, part of the risk is this that you mentioned, because the algal biomass becomes very concentrated and you can, uh, uh, like one strain can over dominate the other strain and the concentration of these allele chemicals that are called the algae released actually becomes very uh, concentrated and it could contaminate potentially the uh, environment. But uh, that's why I said if we manage to uh, establish a 
um, stable enough process with capsule medium nitens with relatively controlled environment like we have some ideas how to control the environment we can uh, probably uh, escape from this uh, problem like uh, diffuse it in some way but we need further research to confirm this Okay, thank you very much for uh, for your time and uh, uh, for uh, staying uh, uh, to to finish the discussion after Professor Metka interview. Uh, uh, I I can think of uh, at least two three more uh, questions because uh, uh, your project is uh, quite interesting, but we leave them for other time. Okay. Once more, thank you for joining and for the wonderful talk. Uh, now I will uh, say a few words myself uh, uh, in the context of wastewater, and I want to uh, to start by saying that we discussed uh, wastewater as a resource of different pollutants and then as a resource of uh, valuable compounds. Uh, the third aspect that I would like to very briefly uh, touch on before the lunch break is wastewater as a resource of important information. For that reason, I will uh, share my slides and... Uh, okay, good. Uh, is uh, everybody seeing the slides? Maybe someone can confirm, Radu? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, good. Good. So uh, I want to uh, touch uh, uh, the topic which is called uh, wastewater based epidemiology, uh, which is uh, um, behind this term uh, stands uh, uh, the principle of measuring different chemical or biological parameters in uh, wastewater. This uh, usually uh, gives information uh, which is uh, relevant for uh, the population and uh, is uh, quite often an uh, interdisciplinary uh, effort which involves different uh, specialists and different stakeholders, including wastewater treatment uh, uh, plant operators and different scientists. Uh, Wastewater-based epidemiology uh, can monitor, like I mentioned, uh, different chemical or biological aspects of wastewater because uh, wastewater is, and this is known for uh, many decades, uh, a very rich and important source of information. One of the more uh, common uses of uh, uh, wastewater monitoring is uh, uh, the consumption uh, of different chemicals, the disease prevalence for different diseases, uh, which are uh, not only pathogenic, but also other diseases uh, uh, for which we can uh, estimate different uh, genetic uh, factors. And also uh, the uh, analysis of uh, pollutants and pesticides that uh, uh, leach uh, in water uh, through agriculture. Uh, waste uh, water epidemiology has been used for more than 20 years and uh, uh, I will give a few very concrete but notable examples um, in terms of uh, infectious diseases uh, maybe the most widespread use of this approach is uh, uh, within the global uh, uh, polio eradication uh, initiative uh, where in some uh, territories throughout the world uh, wastewater-based epidemiology has been used to uh, to uh, uh, to monitor as a early warning systems uh, for outbreaks of uh, polyoma virus. Uh, also, uh, a lot of locations uh, are um, um, are analyzing uh, illicit drugs in the wastewater uh, in order to, to monitor the consumption of those drugs within the society and to identify uh, uh, different hotspots. Uh, wastewater epidemiology has also been used to measure, uh, to measure some uh, lifestyle habits such as consumption of alcohol and caffeine 
as well as consumption of uh, different pharmaceutical uh, drugs such as antidepressants, antibiotics and others. And most recently, uh, wastewater-based epidemiology uh, has been uh, used to uh, monitor the levels of uh, SARS-2 infectious burden within the population because it has been shown that uh, the virus uh, uh, is shed uh, uh, due, uh, via the gastrointestinal tract, enters the, uh, the wastewater and uh, is detectable and also can be used as a valuable tool uh, for important healthcare information and statistics. Uh, what are the uh, main advantages and main challenges uh, uh, ahead of uh, wastewater-based epidemiology? Um, uh, one of the main advantages uh, is that it is extremely useful when we are analyzing uh, pathogens uh, which are associated with uh, asymptomatic infections. Because typically asymptomatic uh, cases of, of infection do not enter our uh, uh, healthcare systems and uh, they are typically mixed, missed. Another important uh, utility of uh, uh, wastewater epidemiology is uh, establishing uh, temporal and spatial trends in disease prevalence. Uh, so this basically means that uh, it could help us uh, monitor certain disease prevalence uh, uh, chronologically through time or through space where we can identify hotspots and respectively areas that are not that heavily affected. Uh, one important thing to note here is that wastewater-based epidemi epidemiology is primarily applicable in places or regions where there is functional sewage systems. Uh, which uh, I consider uh, a bit of a challenge because there are areas where it is simply not possible or at least not that easy. Uh, there are a few also technological challenges uh, which uh, 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 cause uh, some difficulties in uh, wastewater epidemiology. Uh, some of those challenges are uh, listed here. Um, uh, they could be uh, the fact that uh, we, in wastewater we start with a very large amount of, um, uh, of sample volume which we have to concentrate down to a certain level in order to sensitively uh, measure our analyte. Uh, also wastewater is very, uh, uh, very rich in different substances and a lot of those substances can cause inhibition of downstream analysis. And there are also uh, limitations and difficulties associated with data interpretation because uh, uh, despite the specific detection of certain analyzes in wastewater, uh, interpretation also has to take into account different environmental factors such as the rainfall and contribution of different water sources to the sewage system. Uh, now I want to say a few words about uh, wastewater-based epidemiology during the pandemic that we are currently in uh, with uh, the SARS-2 virus. Uh, this, uh, uh, the utility of this approach during the pandemic uh, is uh, largely due, due to the fact that uh, first viral concentrations uh, of SARS-2 in wastewater uh, correlate uh, with, uh, uh, with disease prevalence. Uh, second, the, uh, the levels of SARS-2 virus in uh, wastewater uh, are following the, uh, the uh, exhibition of symptoms by five to eight days, roughly one week. But maybe, and most importantly, uh, SARS-2 levels in wastewater precede uh, PCR test results by several days. And here in the brackets, I say at least two, four days, because this is valid for territories where um, SARS-2 testing on a large scale uh, is uh, uh, 
is possible, but not all territories are able to cover a large percentage of the population. And uh, in such settings, uh, wastewater-based epidemiology can uh, present an even larger shift. Uh, and uh, uh, actually, it can show trends in the uh, uh, in the increase or decrease of the uh, disease prevalence uh, much earlier than what we see, let's say, above the water level. Uh, it is uh, it is also very useful that when analyzing uh, wastewater, uh, we can. Um, uh, we can detect uh, and uh, we can uh, also uh, measure the prevalence of different mutations and different variants uh, of the virus. And uh, also uh, we can, uh, through genomic analysis and sequencing, we can also um, make uh, phylogenetic uh, analysis uh, uh, in order to, to build a, a picture of uh, 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 what uh, variants uh, came from where and uh, how the, the virus has uh, evolved. Uh, in SARS-2 context, there are two common scenarios that are used. Uh, one scenario is uh, large-scale community surveillance, which is used to monitor entire cities or neighborhoods and uh, the application there is to guide the healthcare authorities uh, in uh, addressing uh, hotspot regions where disease is starting to go up, uh, where um, uh, more strict measure measures can be focused uh, uh, at a selected list of hotspots where, for example, uh, um, uh, could be increased the uh, isolation measures or uh, uh, the, the, the level of, uh, of testing uh, or some kind of awareness campaigns. Uh, the other uh, common scenario is small scale monitoring, which can be used to screen wastewater from individual locations, such as a hospital or a factory, a location uh, where usually there is a fixed uh, contingent of uh, visitors. And this is a useful tool for uh, early detection of, uh, uh, of disease and uh, can be used to guide uh, uh, screening of uh, everybody within the facility in order to identify asymptomatic individuals as early as possible. Uh, in uh, SARS-2 wastewater uh, epidemiology, uh, there, is, there are quite a lot of challenges. Uh, the, the most important challenges are um, methodological and uh, they stem from the fact that on every uh, step of the experimental process, there are multiple options uh, of different methods how to perform this step. And there is a lack of, uh, uh, lack of uh, coherence, uh, lack of agreement uh, within the scientific community about what the best options are, simply because all of them work and sometimes the data in publications and in different labs using different methodologies and reagents vary dramatically. Uh, Another challenge is that uh, most of the uh, most of the research is focused on uh, detecting SARS-2 in the liquid fraction of wastewater, uh, but uh, uh, quite possibly uh, the solid fraction uh, should not be overlooked and also could be an interesting object for analysis. Uh, the third challenge is uh, that. Uh, Wastewater epidemiology uh, works to a large extent in, uh, in regions with uh, high disease prevalence, uh, where there is a high concentration of virus in the wastewater. And in low uh, prevalence settings, uh, uh, the, uh, there is uh, potential that we will lose sensitivity and will not be able to detect the virus and uh, uh, 
and picture the useful trends that we uh, could have otherwise. Uh, and last but not least, uh, there is uh, since there is great biological and also methodological variability uh, in the experimental workflow, it is uh, very difficult and actually practically impossible to uh, measure the, uh, uh, the the amount of infected people in a population. Uh, yes, you could make extrapolations and provide approximate figures, but there is uh, a, a lot of inaccuracy in this uh, type of measurement and uh, much more useful data here is really to monitor trends in space and in time about how the, uh, the pandemic and the disease is developing in a certain population. Well, I would say that uh, uh, water, uh, wastewater based epidemiology uh, uh, in the SARS-2 context uh, has already been uh, proven uh, as an important tool and uh, it has been shown to effectively and also sensitively detect asymptomatic cases, uh, which is uh, one of the biggest uh, blind spots that we have when looking at this infection. Uh, also, uh, uh, the direct uh, uh, benefit of uh, this methodology is to uh, to identify hotspots within a certain uh, territory and also to monitor disease trends a few days or even weeks before we see the same trends uh, uh, using conventional techniques such as patient testing. Uh, and the third most important benefit for me that I would like to uh, uh, mark here is that uh, um, advanced technologies such as NGS uh, allow us to uh, perform, perform high throughput sequencing uh, of uh, the virus and uh, uh, this gives us the ability to, uh, to monitor in real time how the virus sequences are evolving, what new variants are emerging and how prevalent they are among a certain population. Uh, with the last slide, I would like to say that uh, SARS-2 um, raised uh, uh, a lot, uh, uh, raised to a great extent the awareness about uh, uh, wastewater-based epidemiology. And now uh, many more researchers, many more uh, wastewater plant facilities are thinking about and also performing uh, uh, molecular testing in wastewater samples. Uh, also, this is coupled with the fact that during the last uh, decade or so, uh, we are uh, seeing uh, a substantial leap of advanced molecular techniques such as NGS and uh, those, two, uh, those two phenomena combined give us a powerful tool to, to harvest even more and more information in uh, the precious sample, which is wastewater. Uh, however, there is still a lot of work uh, we have to do uh, uh, in order to uh, achieve a standardized uh, methodology for the pre-analytical part of the process. And uh, um, uh, unfortunately, this standardized pre-analytical step we, maybe we can standardize it for SARS-2, but every other pathogen requires different uh, uh, different uh, conditions. So uh, basically for different biological objects, uh, we are using uh, protocols uh, uh, that are quite different to each other. Uh, one of the biggest challenges uh, before modern uh, healthcare, uh, which I have uh, uh, also uh, mentioned previously, is of course uh, uh, resistance to antibiotics, uh, where uh, the, uh, uh, the direction we are going uh, is uh, uh, bringing us uh, maybe in 20, 30 years to uh, to a hypothesis where uh, we might be almost out of uh, ammunition to fight uh, 
microbes. And I think this is one of the uh, most important potential applications of uh, wastewater-based epidemiology, uh, which can be used to detect uh, uh, antimicrobial resistance, not only in, uh, uh, let's say, human contributed sewage waters in facilities such as uh, hospitals, but also in, um, uh, in the wastewater of uh, veterinary facilities, farms, uh, uh, or uh, other uh, uh, food processing facilities, uh, which are known as an important reservoir of uh, antimicrobial uh, resistance. Of course, there are a lot, uh, a lot of other potential applications for uh, uh, finding both uh, biological and chemical uh, uh, targets in wastewater. Uh, but I think now that there is a, a great focus on, on this uh, approach and on wastewater as a resource, uh, a lot more work in the upcoming years will be uh, will be done in this direction and we will see interesting analysis and hopefully uh, useful uh, tools in order to uh, to increase our overall quality of life with that i would like to finish and uh, uh, maybe give the word uh, to uh, some of the organizers and uh, we can uh, i think uh, go to lunch break. Thank you, Valo. Thank you. Uh, we are a bit ahead of time, but I believe we can catch up by shortening the lunch break. We don't really need that much in a, a video conference. So if we stick to the initial program, we can come back at 1.45, which is how much is that? Uh, like 40 minutes from now. Yeah. Thank you, Valo. Thanks to all the panelists in the and uh, Professor Metka in the last hour, hour and a half. And uh, let's have something like 40 minutes break and we reconvene back here. Thanks.
Hello, everyone. Hi, Piers. Hello, Reda. How are you? Good. You? Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let me pass the floor to you then. Uh, I hope everyone is back from lunch or coffee break or uh, whatever. I believe we had a couple of interesting sessions in the morning. Various topics, some of them quite deep in detail. Some people from science, some people from water, some institutional people in the very beginning. And um, as per our plans, we have uh, scheduled the afternoon, the next uh, hour or so, to be more on the technologies from the aspect of uh, maturing technologies, commercializing them, introduction to the sector. And we have the pleasure of having Pierce Clark as um, our moderator of this discussion. I have had the pleasure to know him for some years through events like that and uh, other things. And uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, Pierce is one of the extremely proactive people in the water sector working on various fronts, in-house water person in Thames for many years, uh, investment management, BlackRock, if I'm not mistaken, Pierce. And uh, in recent years, definitely the biggest and one of the most interesting ventures that matches needs and uh, the need of the water utilities and the uh, development of the technologies and the startups and the businesses. But I would let you, Pierre, say a couple of words about yourself and then to introduce the people and to moderate them. Over to you, Pierce, and thank you for, for the effort and the activity. Thank you very much, uh, Reda. Uh, every time I've spoken with Rado, he's he's raised football with me, and I I was so ready for him to pick out <laughs> something around the football that had happened last night, but not to be. This must be the this is a first in my conversations with you, Rado. Uh, Pierce is a big Chelsea fan, but as I typically say, when I introduce him, no one is perfect. Over to you, Pierce. <laughs> <laughs> it is a delight to be with you uh, today. I hope you've um, you've enjoyed uh, the sessions that you've had so far. As Rado has just explained, I'm chairing this last session, which is all around the future of the water sector and matching needs with technologies. We've got three speakers, two uh, live and one which is a, a video recording. The way this is going to work is we're going to um, let each of the speakers uh, do their thing, uh, and then I'll have a bit of a Q&A with them. So if you've got any questions you want raised, please just put them in the chat box and um, and we'll pick those questions up after each speaker. Because with the third speaker being a video, um, I think it's better to do it as the questions after each um, each session. So I hope that makes sense. Um, now, my, I'm going to then take a couple of minutes just to introduce myself uh, so that you know who I am before we get to our first speaker. So my name is Dr. Piers Clark, and I'm the chairman of the Isle Group. Uh, I used to work uh, for Thames Water, so I was the commercial director at Thames Water, which is the large water utility that serves uh, London. And I left Thames to join Blackstone, not Black Rock, Blackstone. And if you get the two mixed, oh, did they get excited? Uh, but I briefly worked for Blackstone, the world's largest, and they argue the most successful private equity fund when they had their failed attempt to launch a water fund. And that in itself is a whole new story about why, why did they do it and why did they fail? Um, that's for another day. Um, but I, I worked with Thames Water, I worked with Blackstone, and now I'm the chairman of the Isle Group. Isle is a technical consultancy. We work with uh, about 300 water utilities all around the world, helping them identify and adopt new technology and innovation. So with that in mind, uh, I am delighted to be the moderator for this session, and I'd like to introduce our first speaker. So our first speaker this afternoon is uh, Evgenia Benova. Uh, she is a the assistant professor at Sofia University in Bulgaria. She is also the head of plasma technology of the head of the plasma technology laboratory 
uh, at COC Clean and Circle. Uh, her research interests are plasma physics, plasma technology, including industrial applications of non-thermal atmospheric pressure plasmas, and the interaction of electromagnetic waves with plasmas. So you don't have to be a genius to realize that this talk is going to be about plasmas. Um, she's authored or co-authored more than 50, <laughs> excuse me, more than 55 research articles and more than 50 conference papers uh, in the field of guess plasmas and the applications with more than 400 independent citations. Um, Evgenia, I am I was so excited to have you as the first speaker here because the knowledge I have of plasma, I think could be written on the back of this finger here. So I'm really excited to hear what you can tell us about plasma. The floor is all yours. Chairman, let me just share. I hope, can you see the... Yep. Yep, your cool. screen is shared well. If you put it onto presentation mode, I think it will fill the screen a little bit better. Yes. That's it. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Hans, for uh, presenting us. Uh, uh, actually, I'd like first to thank the organizers for this very interesting and uh, important event. Uh, we'll present this. Uh, uh, our work together with uh, my colleague Ivana Todorova, but actually we are interdisciplinary team of more people that are written here, and uh, we have um, this uh, work together in this uh, interdisciplinary field, uh, which uh, seems to be quite fruitful, and uh, we have very promising results. I'm not going to stress you uh, with the plasma because I think that uh, actually the um, people don't know much about plasma, but they are use plasma even in their everyday life. Uh, that's why uh, I'll just try to uh, to show you where you can find plasma, and after that to see how much. Uh, things are produced by using plasma technology and how it, uh, of course, this will be uh, said by my colleague, uh, how it can be used in the field of uh, waste and water treatment. Uh, of course, as a plasma physicist, I'll speak about the plasma, plasma characteristics and uh, the interaction of plasma with uh, uh, liquids and with water, and uh, after that, uh, my colleague Giovanna Todorova will speak uh, mainly about the technologies for waste and water uh, treatment. What is plasma? Actually, plasma is completely or partially ionized gas where we don't have uh, neutral atoms and molecules, but we have electrons, positive and negative ions. And uh, depending uh, if uh, we have only charged particles or in addition we have some neutral particles, the plasma can be completely ionized or partially ionized gas. And uh, you say that you know almost nothing about plasma, but this, that is not true because uh, it is assumed that about 99% of the matter in the universe is plasma. And uh, the things that you know very well and we cannot live without them are actually plasmas. Starting from the sun and all the other stars, which are plasma, and the uh, sun wind that is coming from the sun to our earth and after that producing aurora which is very beautiful but in the same time is uh, interesting uh, scientific event going to the lightning all this and many other things like ionosphere and things around uh, Earth 
are actually plasma. Uh, and these plasmas uh, have very different uh, characteristics. For instance, inside the sun and the star, uh, the temperature is uh, very high, millions of kelvins. Uh, here in the uh, outer part of the sun called sun corona, it is about 6,000 kelvin, which is not so much. Inside the uh, lightning, the temperature is much higher, 30,000 degrees or kelvin, while in the aurora, the temperature is only uh, equal to the uh, air temperature in this place, so it is it can be very low. You see many examples in the of the plasma in the uh, nature, and we have also uh, plasma technologies from the last century. Uh, widely used for many purposes. Uh, for instance, at atmospheric pressure, the plasma was uh, and still is used for cutting and welding of metals. And it has quite high temperature for this purpose. In the same time, for uh, producing our computers, uh, cell phones, and uh, all the electronic devices that we are using, uh, the plasma technologies for uh, deposition, etching, and so on, is uh, widely used. Uh, lots of technologies for uh, material processing, film field deposition, uh, change of the surface energy, and so on are also used, but uh, widely in in the diagnostics of many in many fields, uh, we are using spectroscopy. It could be uh, optical spectroscopy, mass spectroscopy, and you can see here one of the plasma sources for this purpose, the ICP source. But many others are again plasma sources for the spectroscopy. Uh, in the past uh, about 10 years, uh, the plasma technologies uh, expanded in um, fields which are quite far from physics and techniques. And these are the fields of medicine, agriculture, and uh, waste treatment, water treatment, and uh, fields like this. Why? Because in this uh, last years, it became possible to produce uh, plasma with plasma sources at atmospheric pressure, but with low temperature, while this for cutting and welding uh, plasma is at high temperature. For living organisms, it is necessary to have low temperature. And for this, uh, at atmospheric pressure at the same time, which is not so easy to be obtained. Uh, in the past years, we could produce such plasma sources with low temperature plasma. And because of this in the medicine and in uh, agriculture and other fields uh, like biology, uh, the, this plasma can be now used. Uh, you can see here, several different types of uh, such plasma sources. Uh, although at atmospheric pressure, uh, it can be touched and uh, there is no any thermal damage on the living organism from such plasma sources. And as you could see, the plasma characteristics can be very different depending on the plasma source, both in the nature and in the technology. The main characteristics of plasma are actually the concentrations, the densities of uh, um, charged particles, electrons mainly, 
and heavy particles and the temperatures, the electron temperature, the ion temperature, and the neutral temperature, usually called gas temperature. For when these three temperatures are almost equal, we speak about thermal plasma. It is possible to reach such conditions uh, usually when the, these temperatures are quite high. We have thermal plasma in the stars in the uh, sun, and in the same time, we have thermal plasma for this uh, cutting uh, uh, metals and so on. But for our purposes, most important is the so called non thermal or non equilibrium plasma. The gas temperature of this plasma is lower than the temperature of ions and much lower than the electron temperature. The electron temperature can reach uh, uh, two, three electron volt, which is something about uh, 20,000, 30,000 uh, Kelvin, while the gas temperature may be uh, from room temperature that you can touch to about uh, 6,000 uh, Kelvin. And depending on this, uh, the values of the density and the electron temperature, you can see the broad range of characteristics of plasma for different purposes and in the nature. So we can have uh, plasma with uh, low temperature and uh, high density by right here. And we can have uh, plasma with high temperature and low density like right here. And uh, the one of the main uh, projects, Europe, um, they, it is not only European, it is to produce a reactor for thermonuclear fusion for uh, producing electrical energy by uh, the same process that we have in the sun, in the stars, so to have a small sun here in the earth. This is the ITER project. Uh, For our purposes, we have special requirements to plasma and we have to find appropriate plasma sources that can produce non-thermal plasma with low gas temperature and much higher electron temperature, which is operating in open space, so at atmospheric pressure. And of course, it is important for technological point of view it to be the source to to be easy in easy operation uh, to be easy to control the plasma characteristics and to have high efficiency and safety and of course the price is also something that is important for technological applications till now all the technological plasma applications uh, have a higher price than the conventional methods, but uh, the efficiency is much higher in many cases. So what we are using is uh, surface wave discharge. These are the discharges, the, the sources that we have in our lab. And uh, we can produce plasmas with uh, electron temperature about 1 to EV electrovolts. And the gas temperature varying from the room temperature, as you can see, uh, it can be touched by uh, the finger without damage, up to 5000 Kelvin. Uh, it works in um, different uh, discharge conditions, uh, wave frequency varying from megahertz to then gigahertz, uh, gas pressure, all they can work in atmospheric pressure, but in the same time can work at low pressure from millitor to several atmosphere. The diameter of the tube can be 
very small, about one millimeter, but uh, not in our lab. Uh, the colleagues have produced uh, such plasma at low pressure at um, tube uh, diameter 12 centimeters, which is quite uh, big, and uh, the plasma length from a few millimeters to up to now uh, obtain six meters. And it, all this depends on the electrical power of the wave power. Uh, the good side is that uh, these plasma sources can work in rare gases, molecular gases, gas mixture, and they don't have electrodes. So the plasma that is produced uh, is clear without any uh, additions from the electrodes that we have in other type of plasmas. And uh, there is no corrosion of the electrodes, which uh, would um, lead to, to change of the electrodes quite often. The most uh, uh, recent result uh, about uh, plasma interacting with liquids uh, were obtained in the frame of a cost action that already finished in the past year, but uh, the results are uh, very interesting. And actually, uh, with this cause action, uh, it started uh, uh, very intensive work uh, about the plasma liquid interaction with producing many types of new plasma sources. Some of them presented here, they produce plasma inside the liquid, like this one, or one electrode is inside the liquid, the other is above the liquid, and the plasma that is produced looks like this, or it can be produced inside the liquid by um, a gas flow in bubbles, and in these bubbles, you can see the plasma how it looks like in comparison to the others. What we are doing, actually, uh, we are using our surface wave discharge, producing plasma torch, and this plasma torch uh, react, uh, interact with the liquid. And uh, what we have as active components of this plasma First are the uh, charged particles, electrons and ions. We have heavy chemically active particles like radicals, excited atoms. Uh, the UV radiation is one of the main components in the plasma. In addition to this, depending on the temperature uh, we have uh, obtained, uh, it is possible to have also heating component or we can work without it, depending for what purpose is the plasma, and of course, the electromagnetic field. All these components uh, react with the liquid and with the interface between the liquid and the plasma and produce many chemically active particles which can be used in the plasma technologies, mainly reactive oxygen and reactive nitrogen species that you can see here, presented for the interface, many of them, and inside the liquid. Uh, the UV radiation and the electrons turn out to be very important in production of all these type of particles. And as it is well known, all these type of particles are important for uh, the composition of many uh, wastes in the liquid or in uh, solid uh, waste. Uh, we can use this technology, which is, it is very promising, uh, without adding any um, chemicals additionally uh, to the liquid or in the plasma 
So it is uh, the, the active, uh, chemically active particles are produced by the, by the plasma itself, by the interaction with the liquid in the interface and inside the liquid. And how we can use this and what kind of uh, technologies can be uh, uh, produced from here, uh, this will explain my colleague Jovana Todorova. I'm stopping sharing uh, now and she will continue with sharing the presentation. Thank you for your attention till here. Dear colleagues, uh, I have the pleasure to join this forum uh, and continue the interesting topic for plasma-based technology with more details. Uh, I hope you see the presentation I share. Uh, in my part of the presentation, I'll give the answer of uh, the most important question for us, where can we use the plasma unique uh, futures and its enormous potential in real water and uh, wastewater treatment practice? The short answer is following. We can use the plasma technologies as an in, uh, innovative solution to some of today's biggest challenge in water and waste management. The first of uh, highly appreciated the plasma application is its use for treatment of wastewater with uh, persistent organic pollutants. Um, all of us uh, know that the, this type of pollution is very dan dangerous and high risk for uh, human and ecosystem uh, health. Uh, in the wastewater uh, with uh, persistent organic compounds are very difficult to treat by conventional biotechnological methods. Uh, but uh, how we have seen in the previous slides, the plasma generates at interaction with water uh, some of the well-known uh, strong oxidizers uh, as uh, reactive oxygen species um, and uh, nitrogen species uh, that can affect uh, the organic uh, pollutants um, and they affect the pollutants uh, in synergistically, uh, uh, synergistic uh, uh, way. Uh, this active component can remove uh, effectively a variety of toxic uh, hazardous pollutants as aromatic compounds, that is uh, uh, pharmaceutical and personal care products. Mm. And the plasma technologies uh, are suitable methods for treatment of industrial wastewater as alternative of uh, expensive chemical methods. Um, and they have ad advantages of advanced oxidation processes uh, with uh, high efficiency, um, but at less uh, disposal of sludge. Um, in in modern uh, wastewater treatment installation, uh, the plasma modules can be successfully used as part of hybrid technology from new generation uh, for pre-treatment or post-treatment of uh, uh, this specific type of wastewater. Um, in combination uh, with conventional biological uh, treatment. Uh, not to be unfounded, I will support my words with uh, uh, some examples. Uh, in this slide, uh, uh, you can see part of our uh, result for removal uh, of one aromat aromatic component phenol here and uh, one azudai uh, amarant here. Mm. Uh, we achieve effectiveness of removal more than 60% uh, at very high initial concentration of pollutants. Uh, 
Uh, but the problem of uh, generating more and more dangerous pollutants in the environment has another important aspect. It's related to the sludge. Uh, one of the uh, end products from treatment of uh, wastewaters with uh, possible utilization for different purposes. If the wastewater contains uh, toxic and difficult biodegradable pollutants, the expected result uh, is accumulation of these um, compounds, these uh, uh, pollutants uh, uh, in sludge and reducing uh, its potential to be used in a, a circular e economy. Uh, the plasma technologies can give us one possible solution. Uh, the plasma gasification of uh, sludge accumulated with toxic compounds leads to removal of hazardous pollutants and obtaining a valuable end products, energy as uh, synthesis, gas and safe inert slugs with potential to be used in uh, construction and building activities. On the diagram below, you can see one real uh, example uh, from wastewater treatment plant of Athens, uh, where the installation has uh, potential to utilize uh, 250 tons sludge per day with energy gain and the production of only 25 tons slack per day. Another challenge in treatment of uh, wastewater that is especially relevant uh, today is treatment of specific types of wastewater from uh, hospitals and clinics. These uh, waters contains combination of different pathogens and uh, pharmaceutical products, which further complicates uh, their treatment. The plasma processing removes successfully the chemical compounds by oxidation, and because the plasma also contains strong disinfectants, um, it kills very effect effectively the pathogens. This high sterilization effect of plasma has potential to be used very widely, not only in wastewater treatment, but also in medicine, biotechnology, and then agriculture. Uh, the plasma has an excellent preliminary performance uh, for biomedical purpose with uh, its high content of uh, different disinfectants uh, uh, in, um, and in the reaction of water as uh, hydrogen peroxide, uh, different radicals, uh, ozone, UV radiation, and uh, others. Uh, the plasma treatment leads, uh, leads to additional increase of quality and safety level of drinking uh, or bot uh, bottle uh, water, again with simultaneous uh, removal of toxic compounds, nutrients and pathogens. Mm -hmm. On the, this slide you can see um, one example for effective reduction of bacterial number in water and on surfaces. This is our um, uh, results uh, from our uh, experimental work and the plasma can inactivate uh, bacterial cells at high density and very uh, at very short time of treatment uh, you can see uh, one minute or less uh, uh, treatment time um, and the, this uh, ability uh, to generate uh, um, very active component and plasma without uh, temperature component uh, multiplies the possibilities to use the uh, to use the sterilization effect of plasma. Uh, for example, in plasma assisted medicine therapies, uh, in decontamination of different liquids, uh, products, surfaces, and devices. Uh, the main advantages of this innovative sterilization technique is it easy operation at atmospheric pressure and uh, uh, lack of residual tox uh, toxicity with fast achievement of good bactericidal efficiency. Last but not uh, least, we must underline the uh, uh, virus potential of plasma. Uh, 
treatment of uh, surfaces and liquids with plasma or plasma activated water uh, can lead to uh, affected inactivation of virus uh, particles. Uh, some of the best research teams in the world uh, have been work, uh, worked intensively last year to show the plasma uh, uh, viricidal effect, especially for coronavirus, uh, one very um, actual topic uh, nowadays, it uh, has already been proven that the plasma active components destroy the, res the res uh, receptor binding domain of uh, uh, S1 subunit of spike protein and the viruses are not able to enter in the cells. Uh, this application is very important in uh, our new reality and we need to take this advantage, uh, advantages uh, the, um, and use the plasma potential, um, potential in the fight against this uh, pandemic and the uh, uh, other uh, challenges in our um, uh, society. Uh, in these few minutes, we present some of the most uh, in illustrative examples for the use of plasma technology uh, in solving of the challenges of water and uh, wastewater treatment. Uh, the team of our center of competence, Clean and Circle, works intensively in these aspects, and we all believe that one of the future ways uh, the de development uh, in the sector of clean technology uh, is the use of enormous potential of plasma. Thank you for your attention. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Yovana. Thank you, uh, Evgenia. It's been brilliant to have that overview and such a complicated topic that you've made so simple and so accessible. So um, brilliant. Well done. Thank you for that. Now, normally, I would pause and we'd have questions, but actually I think we're going to be really pushed on time. So if you don't mind, what I'm going to do is I'm going to let the other presentations uh, do their bit. And if we've got time at the end, we're going to come back. But just as my, yeah, I'd love to know you, you gave that tantalizing comment around how, you know, this technology isn't economic at the moment, but, but it's more efficient. And I'd love to know when do we think that efficiency economic balance is going to flip in favor? That I, I know that's a difficult question to answer, but I'd love to get your view on it if we have time at the end. But thank you very much. It's very difficult giving presentations in these Zoom environments where you're simply looking at your computer in your uh, from wherever it is you're based, and you did you did brilliantly. If I could now ask our next speaker, uh, Dr. Murthy Chivali, to turn on his camera uh, while I introduce him. Um, so, uh, Dr. Shivali is Professor of Analytical Chemistry and Nanotechnology, and he serves as a director of the SVRM College and is Executive Director of Asha Nanocomposite Technologies in India. If you flick on his um, biography details, for my word, the number of citations and awards that you have, Murphy, is truly impressive. I, I'm in awe to be in your presence. I'd love to read them all, but I'm not going to because I want to preserve the time so that you can take us through your day. Um, I'm going to hand straight back over to you. Thank you. Oh, I think you can hear me. Okay. Yeah, we can hear you perfectly. Okay. But we can't see your slides. It's going on. Okay. Is it visible? Not yet, no. If there's, okay. a, if there's a problem, I might ask um, Rado or one of the other organizers if uh, if they could um, share the slides on your behalf, and then maybe you can just. That's right. Next. That's right. Can we do that, um, please? There we go. Dejana has uh, kindly shared them. So you can just talk, and if you just start saying okay. slide, please, that's the way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
Anyway, there is some uh, slight uh, change in the fonts and uh, colors because of change in computer. Anyway, I'll go ahead and I'll uh, stipulate myself uh, for 20 to 25 minutes. Uh, thank you for having me here in this uh, wonderful event, Water and Biotechnologies. And uh, as, I, as you know from my slides, I'm going to talk about uh, very generally on some of the nano and biotechnologies for water. Next slide, please. And uh, in this particular presentation, I'm going to talk uh, a little bit on uh, industrial challenges, water challenges, what are the technologies, what is the role of technology uh, in uh, purifying this water, and also what are the research options that we have specifically towards nanotechnology and biotechnology, what is the role of nanobiotechnology in water purification, and so on and so forth. If time permits, I'll be talking a little bit about digitalization and summarize everything at the end. Next slide, please. Yeah, uh, this is the most uh, primitive most slide, just to give an uh, uh, impression that uh, the level percentage of uh, uh, the pure water, what we have for drinking is just 2.5% uh, and of which 30% is already in the form of groundwater, rest is in the lakes and whatever available is very, very little. So there is a need for us to go ahead to preserve, reclaim, reuse, whatever it is, to have the next generations. Next slide, please. Water is at its uh, scarcity levels, and uh, it is not just accessing drinking water, but also about the sanitation and uh, other things like uh, climate change, where we have a melting of glaciers, rising sea levels, and the longer droughts compared to earlier uh, years. Lack of clean and fresh water, approximately 1.2 billion people are inadequate of uh, fresh potable water, and at the same time, uh, 2.6 billion people, they do not have any hygiene, high, uh, hygienous water, and uh, millions are going to uh, die, and uh, at the same time, millions are dying because of health-related issues and uh, sicknesses. And for example, by 2025, as per the report of the United Nations, 1.8 billion will be living with water scarcity and the demand for irrigation is also going to jump by 15%. This is the report prepared by United States. And uh, 2025 is not going to be very far, just four years from now. Next slide, please. And uh, the challenges that we include, not just uh, pollution, but the impacts of climate change, resurgence, of uh, water-related diseases and also our uh, ecosystem uh, destructions. And one of the uh, top five trends impacting water industry over the next decade is mounting effects of extreme weather events, protecting agriculture production, as we need a lot of productivity over the generations to come, and also reusing the wastewater to support a circular economy and customer-led revolution. Plus, at the same time, we also need to implement, use smart and intelligent network technologies. For example, if you take by 2050, uh, in the US, it could be rising by 5.7 degree Fahrenheit, which means uh, we are going to have a lot of uh, more frequent and more intense heat waves and uh, even droughts, which is very much possible. As we know, that as the temperatures warm up, you have uh, losses in the form of evaporations and decrease in uh, volume of water in the lakes and so on and so forth. We have reduction in potable water. Next slide, please. And if you compare this with uh, uh, industry challenges, uh, we have uh, five challenges where we have, uh, can you go to the next slide, please? We have uh, five challenges compared to the industry. One is aging infrastructure and uh, maintenance of the same, managing the cost with uh, uh, raising electricity prices, and at the same time, growth of uh, urban population, and also environment and sustainability, skills in shortage, and aging workforce. And all these things can be uh, done by simply using IoT-enabled sensors to some extent, and other remote monitoring, and so on and so forth. We have to face these water challenges because of uh, rapid industrialization and rapid uh, globalization. So these are some of the industry-oriented water problems that we are going to face in the coming years, unless until we address these uh, five challenges, we are uh, going to face uh, severe drought conditions with uh, water, especially related to 
uh, industrialization. Next slide, please. And uh, it is generally considered as white gold for the 21st century because we have a lot of depletion and a lot of things are going to happen just because connected with uh, water. And we need to preserve this uh, particular uh, sector in uh, different ways possible. The different technologies can be applied and at the same time, uh, primitively, we can say use of telemetry, remote connections, and the meters to manage software uh, for um, water volume collection without need to go there, and uh, integration of third-party systems with uh, existing systems. I'm going to talk about a little bit in one or two slides uh, about the integration of third-party systems, and at the same time, implementation of these things could also create uh, market opportunities in different industries and uh, finally we'll be able to use water sustainably and at the same time uh, promoting uh, the creation of increasingly powerful network infrastructure will also lead to overcome all these problems for sustainable use of water thank you next slide please and if you talk about water technologies for especially in terms of purification there are n number of technologies n number of startups are going to come up uh, or coming up and especially in uh, uh, Gulf countries, Europe, and other places, we have a lot of desalination plants. And if you talk about specific technologies where people are trying to use from different fields, engineering, sciences, applied sciences, and nanotechnology, you have uh, nanotechnology for filtration, like ultrafiltration and nanofiltration, uh, depending on the type of uh, uh, mineral content that you need to have for a different purpose, and the membrane chemistry, seawater desalination, smart monitoring, especially this is being used in developing countries and in the Gulf, especially in the Europe. Spain is leading in uh, one of the smart monitoring systems. And also you need to have inti intelligent irrigation systems and uh, wastewater processing, reuse, reclamation, and also in petroleum and oil gas industry where you use a lot of uh, water, you need to have uh, mobile recycling units or recycling facilities, plus at the same time, you also have a biotechnology, which is one of the top theme for this particular event, the one day event in water technology. So I'm going to concentrate a little bit on some of the works that we have done for water purification using nanotechnology and biotechnology. And I'll touch upon one or two other points uh, during the course of my presentation. And uh, as I said, it is going to be a general talk, not uh, deep technical into the very specific uh, details of nanotechnology and biotechnology. Next slide, please. And if you have some uh, uh, innovations, innovations in the sense, enhancement of anything that you have in the present day uh, could lead to innovations either in nanotechnology or biotechnology. And uh, these innovations will advance water sustainability and resilience worldwide. Definitely it is going to improve our performance in of small systems rather than having a huge system set up at one place instead of uh, portable, movable, smaller systems in everywhere where uh, scarcity of water is there and reducing water impacts on energy production. Nowadays, we have systems and technologies where you produce, uh, where you treat water and at the same time you produce some of the byproducts in terms of energy or any other purpose of usage. So it is one of the innovative ideas where you have byproducts and 100% treatment for example, microalgae and macroalgae, where we use uh, treating uh, algae, uh, algal biomass, and at the same time we produce bio, uh, bioethanol or biohydrogen, whatever it is. And also, we can grow infrastructure, markets will develop, and at the same time, employment chances are there. And it will be the best source having uh, less economics and at the same time, higher uh, innovations to access safe drinking water and sanitation purposes. Application of nanoscale iron, for example, uh, to treat uh, calcitrant and toxic industrial solvents in groundwater, having nanoscale sensors, minute microscopic or very simple uh, nano sensors that have been used, because these sensors are going to cost uh, come down the, in the cost, and effectively they are going to monitor and let you tell you from one place to other remotely where you there is no need for you to go there and measure the volume or the contaminant level. It can be addressed over IoT. So IoT-based nanoscale sensors are one of the real-time solution for in-situ detection of chemical constituents and also pathogens. Usage of nano, simple nano filters. I'm going to talk about one of the nano filters that we have developed, which is less than a dollar to produce. 
and nanobiocides and magnetic nanoparticles and these are specific things where you can remove the pathogens and at the same time uh, you can uh, do it by yourself you don't need any specific intelligence or knowledge for applying these things and also some of the photocatalysts where they can have uh, uh, they can be used for pathogen removal or target some of the pathogens and at the same time self sterilizing uh, uh, containers for on site uh, portability of the water and some of the filters that you may require to agglomerate and uh, make it uh, portable to drink immediately within few seconds next slide please for example if you talk about technologies there are 10 most important ways where you can uh, develop considering the real need one in nine people in the world have le le less access or no access to clean drinking water and three to four million die yearly because of waterborne diseases and this has to be this is being a added with growing global population and climate change which is also very much threatening and for this particular reason there are many startups coming up with uh, to tackle water problems and at the same time biotechnology and nanotechnology is being added you need to have uh, innovative ideas like uh, powering cars with hydrogen using uh, less amount of fuels greenhouse gases everything can be de decreased and also you have large resource of saline water where you can desalinate them and also you can utilize and uh, apply uh, big data and artificial intelligence to these things and uh, designing some of the existing uh, systems and use of uh, drones and data and high-tech filtration unit like simple low-cost nanofilters for uh, bulk scale so that all these technological ways we can uh, develop we can enhance we can grow and at the same time we can also uh, treat the existing water so that uh, this can be used for next coming generations next slide please what are the options we have in balancing the demand and also using the available water resources we have plenty of sources, not just this, but one of the five options that uh, I have designed is better water management and conservation, usage of technologies, not just nanotechnology and biotechnology, but uh, any simple technology, cost effective, it can be used by a common man, which is required to balance as per the requirement of uh, uh, demand, and at the same time, reuse untreated water and also uh, reclaim the wastewater in different ways. So. These are not just the top five options, but some of the options uh, which can be easily be maintained and uh, where you can balance this water demand with the water resources. Next slide, please. As I said, uh, nanotechnology will play a vital role in uh, water purification technologies because this is one of the area where we are working on for uh, different uh, biomedical sensors, sensors, chemical, physical sensors, and integrating them with uh, IoT, artificial intelligence, and wireless sensor networks. And at the same time, nanotechnology holds the future for completely removing effectively, uh, making uh, portable water. Uh, and at the same time, there are different types of nanomaterials. Why we use nanomaterials or nanoparticles? Because they have uh, unlimited unique properties that can be telemetered for our requirement at the same time we can also fine tune these uh, properties using these nanomaterials for example if you take carbon nanotube they have surface area and small volume and uh, chernobyl surface chemistry because you can uh, make them bond with other things and you can do as per as your requirement they have high mechanical strength they have high chemical stability they also have uh, adsorption properties antimicrobial activity so on and so forth and uh, Using this nanotechnology, I'll try to give one of the examples for oil spill and one as a water purifying system. And also, if time permits, I'll go with electrochemical carbon nanotube filters. Next slide, please. Yes, one of the major thing what uh, many people are doing is desalination. And uh, to need to cover the existing population, and uh, because of rapid urbanization and industrialization, more and more uh, cubic meters of water, fresh water is required. Currently, there are around uh, 63 million cubic meters of water is being desalinated, so over uh, 14,000 plants globally each day. And especially 10% comes from Europe, and of which uh, Spain is the one which is uh, very much uh, uh, leading. And uh, at the same time, you have a lot of 700 plants 
plus Europe also holds 10% uh, of global desalination system. And uh, there are so many other uh, titanium oxide catalysts, et cetera, et cetera, for usage of this thing. And, and at the same time, we are also uh, in, interested in fouling and scaling uh, and monitoring of other things using different types of techniques. Next slide, please. And combining this with the desalination system, solar water system, new center in uh, Rice University, Texas, people have integrated solar technology by using light harvesting, nanophotonics, and uh, membrane distillation technology, where they were able to develop 17.5 kilowatts per meter, and at the same time, uh, using concentrated uh, sunlight of uh, by 25 times. So this has been increased per square meter by six liters. So integrating one technology with other in an effective way could also solve this water purification problem. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. And uh, you have a lot of uh, nanotechnologies and uh, innovations. Why we use nanotechnology, as I said, it has a mobility to fine tune and tailor made some of the nanoparticles depending on uh, number of properties. As you can see, you have water solubility, physical binding, and uh, uh, accumulation, agglomeration, all these things, chemical reactivity and stability, ag aggression behavior, everything can be monitored using tailor made nanoparticles. Next slide, please. And desalination can be done in uh, different ways, thermal, mechanical, electrical, chemical, and so on and so forth properties. But only one problem with this is if it is uh, drinking water, desalination may not serve the purpose because the mineral content is going to be very, very less compared to our uh, drinking water. But still, it can be used for uh, different uh, industrial purposes. And uh, compared to the options that we generate because of desalination, uh, one of the best way by integrating uh, different techniques into desalination, this is going to be one of the best way in uh, reclaiming our uh, water, either wastewater or seawater. Next slide, please. And uh, coming to membrane process, which nanotechnology also very well uh, deserved with uh, nanofiltration, ultrafiltration, microfiltration. This is a typical slide where you can see different types of pathogens and particles that are being present in the raw water. And you can see onto your uh, uh, left-hand side, uh, different types of techniques that we use uh, based on the technique. We can uh, tailor made our uh, nanoparticles for that particular purpose, and it can be employed for enhanced membrane processes using either microbiology or uh, biotechnology or uh, uh, nanotechnology. Next slide, please. Murphy, um, can yeah, I just yeah. give you a sort of time flag here and ask if you could look to wrap up in the next two or three minutes? That's right. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, this is one of the graphene based uh, filter and where they can have 97% uh, of uh, uh, purified things and that means they can remove 100% of these particular things and uh, when commercially this has been made, they came to 97%. Next slide please. But uh, this particular graphene based desalination unit reduced the cost by 40%. And uh, com coming to other thing where graphene, where they used uh, heat powered membrane distillation. With this, they were able to do so many other things. And at the same time, they can also convert this particular type of uh, unit, uh, not just for desalination, but also for oil spills and pathogen removal. Next slide, please. And uh, other uh, oil uh, spill recovery systems for uh, water purification units. This can also be used, but not very efficient, but uh, number of recycles, recycles can, cycles can be used for up to five times, and this can be applied in high and low level petroleum hydrocarbons. Next slide, please. Now, this is one of the things what we have developed using uh, different polymers as a polyurethane dishwashing sponge. Uh, the idea of this is, uh, I'm not going to run the video, but uh, still, uh, this converts the entire oil spill uh, taken up uh, by fivefold by this particular sponge, and uh, uh, the water in which uh, oil is there can be immediately drinkable. That means it is uh, converting itself into a portable thing. Next slide, please. Uh, biotechnology is going to convert uh, the entire water industry, which is going to be the next frontier. And it has so many other alternatives in removal. One of the best thing is capturing water from wastewater and using it as fertilizer. One of the best example for biotechnology in wastewater treatment. Next slide, please. 
Next slide, please. And the recent biotechnologies in wastewater is microbial biotechnology, where we are trying to use different types of algae for treating industrial wastewaters and also saline waters, where algae are uh, uh, largely grown in highly saline waters compared to others. And we are also using some of the green synthesis nanobiotechnology and combining nanotechnology with uh, uh, biotechnology. So new field of uh, nanobiotechnology for uh, wastewater treatment has been arose. Next slide, please. Uh, some of the biomimicking things like encapsulation, biomimicry, biogermentation are typically used for wastewater treatment. And these are some of the examples that have been listed out here. Next slide, please. And we also use in our uh, particular area where uh, uh, specifically biotechnology used for in two domains. One is increasing productivity underwater scarcity and at the same time uh, improving the efficiency of use of applied irrigation water using biotechnology means. And we have so many sectors in this particular area where we are trying to produce in uh, different areas where we apply biotechnology tools for specifically uh, using less amount of water and increase the productivity. Next slide, please. And uh, coming to the portable water biotechnology where we have a lot of benefits, reduced, uh, reduced costs, and at the same time, minimal environmental footprint, and at the same time, consumption of available drinking water is minimized and resources can be reused so that all these things can be done by bioaugmentation or using any biomedical biotechnologies for safe drinking of water. Next slide, please. And as I said, uh, we are using uh, nanofilters which we have prepared. Go to the next slide, please. In this, uh, we try to develop a filter using a cellulose Sandwich, sandwiched with uh, graphene oxide and a, a people leaf, uh, leaf substrate where we try to use uh, less than uh, $2 of uh, this particular filter for completely removing the pathogens and uh, contaminants and uh, they made it possible for drinking. And uh, we also use this for dye removal where uh, removal of the dye is 86 to 90%. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. These are some of the examples where we use uh, different dyes and membranes. Next slide, please. And some of the microorganisms that have been uh, done by our group, and also we produce uh, biohydrogen and uh, bioethanol during the course of treatment using microorganisms. These are some uh, of the other examples. Next slide. I'm afraid I'm going to have to jump in. We've got a we've got one last yes. slide with a video. Can I ask you to jump to your last slide, please? Yes, yeah. it's done. Next slide. Next slide, please. I'm not going to talk about anything. And uh, with this, I'll try, I think, I hope, uh, yes. is a general lecture where I've given some influence about our research work on nanotechnology and biotechnology. And of course, I did not talk about the four pillars of biotechnology, but still, this is useful for uh, making uh, potable water under purified conditions for using biotechnology. Next slide, please. Yeah, these are some of the references. Next slide. Thank you for your attention. Murphy, I, I wish I was one of the, your students. You know, <laughs> it, it, it's like drinking from a fire hose. There's so much information there that um, it, I... I uh, my, that my, was... my, my, my apologies, I could not do it uh, in a proper way because of some problems with the internet. Uh, that's fine, it's not a problem. Uh, I think we got the gist of just how deep your expertise is and how influential this area of chemistry could be to making water treatment uh, and water processes better in the future. So thank you for that. Thank you very much. <laughs> now, um, we have gone over time, but there is one last speaker who's actually prepared a video. So we've got a short okay. video to play. So Murphy, right. if I can ask that you turn your, your camera off now, um, yeah. that'd be good, but thank you very much. Um, and we're just going to finish with, uh, Cynthia Berzels, we've got a video to That's play. Right. She was unable to be with us. So um, I'm not sure who turns on this video. But uh, I'm hoping one of the organizers has control. Yes, that's it. My name is Cynthia Brazell, and my background is in marine and medical microbiology.
monitoring probes. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I think I'm back on video now. Um, I, I'm sorry, my job as, as moderator was terrible there. We've, we've overrun. So we, we don't have time for questions, but I am going to pass uh, straight back to Dimitar to uh, close out the conference. But what a session. I mean, look at the level of detail there that we had. That's one of the most technically chunky um, uh, pieces of, of uh, conference that I've been to for a while. Some brilliant feed, um, thoughts shared there. So thank you to all the speakers. Back to the main hosts. Pierce, thank you very much as well. Actually, if somebody made this session wonderful, this was you. Not only with your comments, but also with the fact that you were so strictly following the timeline. Otherwise, uh, we could have uh, uh, gone until the evening uh, because there were really fantastic talks and also fantastic details. But really, moderating is from time to time a pleasure, but also a terrible job. So there was a suggestion from my team that you should chair also other sessions because we love your discipline in the way how you are introducing and commenting the speakers. Thank you very much, indeed. Thank you. Now it's my pleasure to also to uh, give the floor to Kaoyan, who was the actually the third organizer of this event. Kaoyan was uh, extremely helpful with networking, with his uh, excellent knowledge with the Vienna Business Agency and with the, our Vienna Partnership, but also with his cool and extremely realistic approach to the developments. Kaoyan, please, it's your turn now. Thank you very much for the kind words. Uh, from my side, I just want to thank everybody, uh, especially the team, uh, organizers. Uh, the ladies behind us, uh, and, uh, of course, all our partners and speakers, uh, namely the Vienna Business Agency, who were very supportive, uh, but also the W uh, and um, and all the other uh, partners and speakers. I think uh, Dimitar will have uh, his uh, final thank you, thank you words. Uh, from my side, thank you for the uh, uh, your team, and uh, uh, we stay in contact. We plan that the next uh, biotech uh, atelier is all, uh, already in our minds. So, looking forward to that. Dimitar, uh, give the word. Posted on the website of the biotech atelier, and very soon there will be a full recording of uh, this uh, wonderful session. Uh, so uh, it will be available in full length, the entire atelier in YouTube, and everybody who is registered and also other interested parties would be able to uh, download and uh, enjoy it. So every uh, good thing has a beginning and also an end. Uh, it's my pleasure to say that our uh, great event today is coming to its end. From my side and from the side of the founders of the Biotech Atelier, also our cordial uh, thanks to Gergana and her crew and to everybody who contributed to this event. Thank you very much and have a nice day. Bye bye.